Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 372. She slept, really slept, like she couldn't remember ever sleeping before, so safe and sheltered, though she didn't know how long. When she dressed, her clothes were clean and seemed to sparkle like new. Chase's clothes, too, were bright and shiny. She held hands and danced in circles with other children, glowing children, whose voices and laughter echoed. It made her laugh, too, laugh with happiness like none she had ever felt before. When she was hungry, she and Chase lay in the grass, the warm fog and glowing, smiling faces around them, and ate things that were sweet and delicious. When she was tired, she slept, never having to worry about where she slept, because she was safe, safe at last. And when she wanted to play, the other children came to play with her. They loved her. Everyone loved her. She loved everyone. Sometimes she walked alone. Filmy shafts of sunlight streamed through the trees. Glowing meadows were filled with wildflowers bowing in the gentle breeze, winking with bright specks of color. Sometimes she walked with Chase holding his hand. She was so happy that he was contented now. He never had to fight anyone anymore. He was safe, too. He said he was at peace. He sometimes took her for walks and showed her the woods where, he said, he grew up, where, he said, he had played when he was as little as she. She smiled with delight at the look of happiness in his eyes. She loved him and was fulfilled, knowing he, like she, had found peace at last. She looked up, and a small smile touched her thin lips. She hadn't heard a sound, and she needn't turn to look in the near darkness. She knew he was there on the other side of the door. She knew how long he had been there. Her legs still crossed, she rose smoothly on a cushion of air hovering above the straw-covered floor. The boy's limp arms swung as they dangled, like weighted fishing line. Lacking any life or rigidity, his back bent backward, draping over her arm. In her other hand was clutched the statue. She unfolded her legs and stretched her slippered feet to the floor, settling her weight on them. As the boy slid from her arm, the dead weight of his head thunked against the floor. His arms and legs flopped askew to one side. His clothes were filthy. Disgusted, she wiped her hands on her skirts. Why don't you come in, Jedediah? Her voice echoed from the cold stone. I know you're there. Don't try to pretend you're not. The heavy door squeaked slowly open, and the shadowed figure strolled into the light of a single candle burning on a rickety nearby table that was the lower room's only accoutrement. He stood relaxed, silently watching as the orange glow faded from her eyes, and they returned to the pale, pale blue shot through with violet flecks. His gaze went to the statue in her hand. The owner sent me to find that. She wants it back. The thin smile grew. Does she now? She shrugged. Well, I'm through with it. She held it out to him. For now. Jedediah's face was a calm mask as he took the statue. She doesn't like it when you borrow her things. She ran a finger down his cheek. She is not the one I serve. I don't really care what she likes and what she doesn't. You would be wise to care a little more. Her smile brightened. Really? I could give her the same advice. She twisted, holding an arm out to the body on the floor. He had the gift. Slowly her hard eyes came back to his, the smile gone, as if one had never touched her features in all her life. Her voice came in a venomous hiss. I have it now. The slightest frown of puzzlement touched his cool expression. Think we must have the ceremony, Jedediah, the ritual in the Hagen Woods? She slowly shook her head. Not anymore. That is only the first time, because we are female, and female Han cannot absorb the male. Her voice lowered to a derisive whisper. Not any longer. Now that I have the gift of a male, I can accept others without the ritual. Her face glided to within inches of his. So can you, Jedediah, she breathed. With the quillion, so can you. I could teach you. It's so easy. I simply showed him the joining rite to try to show him his Han. Her cheek brushed his as she whispered into his ear. But he didn't know how to control his gift. I created a vacuum in the quillion. She drew back to appraise his eyes. It sucked the life right out of him, sucked the gift 
right out of him. It's mine now. He studied her eyes a time before glancing down at the body. I don't recall seeing him before. She continued to whisper to him from only inches away. Don't play games with me, Jedediah. What you really mean is, where did I find him and why haven't the sisters, if he has the gift? He shrugged nonchalantly. If he has the gift, why isn't he collared? She cocked her head to the side. Because he is so young, his Han is too weak to be detected by the other sisters. She tilted her head to the other side, but not by me. She touched her nose to his. He was right here in the city, right under their noses, probably the offspring of a dalliance by one of you naughty boys. Very efficient. Saves having to bother with reports. Avoids awkward questions. She glanced down at the body. Be a good boy and dispose of him for me. I found him living in squalor down near the river. Dump him back there. No one will think anything of it. He lifted an eyebrow. You wish me to clean up after you? She ran a finger down his neck and across his throat, across his Radahan. You make a serious mistake, Jedediah, if you think of me as a mere sister. I have the male gift now, same as you, and I know how to use it. You wouldn't believe how much that power increases when you add the Han of another. It would appear that you are becoming a sister to be reckoned with. A wise person would take care with you. She patted his cheek. Smart boy, Jedediah. She gave him a little frown as she slipped her hands to his waist. You know, Jedediah, you may think of yourself as powerful in the gift, but I think you should worry about that. You have never had one to challenge your abilities before, your rightful place among the wizards here, but a new one comes. He will be here soon, and you have never seen one like this before. I think you may no longer be the pride of the palace. His countenance showed no reaction, but his face slowly heated to red. He lifted the statue. Well, you did say you would like to teach me. She waggled a finger in front of his face. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, he is mine. You may have another. Any gift will swell your power, but this one is mine. He waggled the statue in front of her face. She might have something to say about that. She has plans of her own. Plans for him. She smiled with one side of her mouth. I know, and you are going to keep me informed of her plans. He lifted an eyebrow. You have plans for me? The smile grew to both sides of her mouth. Very special plans. Her hands roamed lower down the sides of his hips, feeling the firmness of his young muscles under his robes. You're good with your hands, good at making things, making things in metal. I have something I want you to make for me, something invested with magic. I hear that's one of your talents with the gift. You wish a trinket, an amulet, perhaps in silver or gold? No, no, dear boy. You're to make it from steel. You're to gather the steel of a hundred sword points. Very special sword points. Sword points from the armory. Old ones, ones that have been used, ones that have pierced flesh in combat. He arched an eyebrow. And what is it you wish made? She slid a hand up the inside of his thigh. We'll talk about it later. She smiled at how quickly he responded to her touch. You must be lonely since Margaret ran away. So lonely. I think you need a friend who understands you. Did you know, Jedediah, that with the male Han comes a unique understanding of the male? I now understand in a new light what it is that men appreciate. I think we're going to be very special friends. As a special friend, you get the reward before performing the task. She trickled a thread of magic into him, focusing it where it would do the most good. Her smile widened as his head rolled back. His eyes closed and he let out a throaty groan and then gasped. Panting, he clutched his hands to her bottom, drawing her to him, and crushed his open mouth to hers. She kicked the body out of her way as she let him force her to the straw-covered floor. Chapter 36 The wolverine grew larger in his vision. The arrow waited for the flat, dark head to lift. A low growl came from behind his left shoulder. Quiet, Richard hissed. The gar fell silent. The wolverine's head rose. With a zip, the arrow was away. Wings a-quiver, the little gar bounced on the balls of its feet, its attention riveted to the flight of the arrow. 
Wait, he whispered. The gar froze. With a solid thunk, the arrow found its target. The gar squealed in glee. Wings spreading and flapping, it bounced higher and turned to him. Richard leaned close and pointed a finger at the gar's wrinkly nose. The gar watched him attentively. All right, but you bring me back my arrow. Head bobbing in quick agreement, the gar bounded into the air. Richard watched by the dim early dawn light as it swooped down on the dead quarry, pouncing as if it were about to escape. Fur flew as claws ripped. The dark silhouette lowered, its wings folding against its back as it hunched over the prey, growling and pulling its meal apart. Richard turned from the sight and watched instead the streaks of cloud change color against the brightening sky. Sister Verna would be awake soon. He still stood his watch despite her insistence that it wasn't necessary. She finally relented, but he knew she was angry because he wouldn't back down. That made her angry. What didn't? She was more angry than usual since coming through the valley the day before. She was silently livid. Richard glanced toward the little gar to see it was still eating. How it had managed to follow him through the Valley of the Lost, he couldn't imagine. He had thought it was a mistake to keep feeding it before they reached the valley, but he felt responsible for it. Every night when he had taken his watch, it had come to him, and he had hunted food for it. He had thought he had seen the last of it when they crossed over into the old world, but somehow it had followed. The little gar was passionately devoted to him when he was on watch. It ate with him, played with him, and slept at his feet, if not on them. When his watch was over, it hardly made a fuss about him leaving. Richard never once saw the gar at any other time. It seemed to instinctively know to stay away from the sister, to avoid letting her see it. Richard was reasonably certain she would try to kill it. Maybe the gar knew that. He was continually surprised by the intelligence of the furry little beast. It learned faster than any animal he had ever seen. Kalin had told him that short-tailed gars were smart. Now he knew how right she was. He had only to show it something once or twice to make it understand. It was learning to understand his words and tried to imitate him, although it didn't seem to have the capacity for speech. Some of its sounds came strangely close. Richard didn't know what to do about the gar. He thought perhaps it should strike out on its own, learn to hunt and survive, but it wouldn't leave. It followed out of sight wherever they went, even through danger. Perhaps it was too young to get by on its own. Maybe it saw Richard as its only way to survive. Maybe it saw him as a surrogate mother. In truth, Richard didn't really want it to leave. It had become a friend as they had traveled through the wilds. It gave him unconditional love, never criticized him, and never argued with him. It felt good to have a friend. How could he deny the same thing to the gar? The flap of wings brought him out of his thoughts. The gar thumped to the ground before him. It had gained a lot of weight since Richard had first found it. He would have sworn it had grown nearly half a foot, too. The sinew under the pink skin of its chest and belly had become taut, and its arms were no longer all hide and bone as they had been, but were thickening with muscle. He was afraid to think of how big it would eventually get. He hoped it would be on its own by then. Hunting enough food to feed a full-grown short-tailed gar would be a full-time occupation. After wiping the shaft on its fur-covered thigh to clean off the blood, the gar flashed Richard its hideous blood-stained grin and held out the arrow. Richard pointed over his shoulder. I don't want it. Put it back where it belongs. The gar reached over Richard's shoulder and slid the arrow back into the quiver that leaned against a stump. It contorted its features, seemingly to question if it had done it correctly. Richard smiled as he patted its full belly. Good boy. You did it right. The gar flopped happily on the ground at his feet, contenting itself with licking blood from its claws and coarse fur. When it finished, it laid its long arms over Richard's lap and rested its head on them. You need a name. The gar looked up, cocking its head to the side. Its tufted ears turned toward him. Name. He tapped his chest. My name is Richard. The gar reached out and tapped Richard's chest in imitation. Richard. Richard. It cocked its head to the other side. It growled through sharp fangs, its ears twitching. Richard nodded. Rrrr. Richard. It tapped Richard's chest again. Grr. It said in its throaty growl, this time showing less teeth. Richard. Rotch. Arg. Richard laughed. That's close. Now, what are we going to call you? Richard thought about it, trying to think of something appropriate. 
The gar sat, its brow bunched into deep furrows, watching him intently. After a moment, it took Richard's hand and tapped it against his chest. Rods, arg, it said. It pulled Richard's hand to its own chest, tapping it against the fur. Gratch. Gratch? Richard sat up straighter in surprise. Your name is Gratch? He tapped the gar again. Gratch? The gar nodded and grinned as it tapped its own chest. Gratch. Gratch. Richard was a little taken aback. It had never occurred to him that the gar might have a name. Gratch it is, then. He tapped his own chest again. Richard. He smiled and patted the gar's shoulder. Gratch. The gar spread its wings and thumped its chest with open claws. Gratch. Richard laughed, and the gar leapt on him, letting out its throaty giggle as it wrestled him to the ground. Gratch's love of wrestling was second only to its love of food. The two of them tumbled across the ground, laughing and struggling to gently get the best of each other. Richard was gentler about it than Gratch. The gar would put its mouth around Richard's arm, though thankfully at least it never bit. Its needle-sharp fangs were long enough to easily go all the way through his arm, and he had seen the gar splinter bone with those teeth. Richard brought the wrestling match to an end by sitting up on the stump. Gratch sat straddling him, arms, legs, and wings wrapped around him. It nuzzled against Richard's shoulder. Gratch knew that at dawn Richard left. Richard spied a rabbit in the underbrush some distance off and thought that perhaps Sister Verna would appreciate some meat for breakfast. Gratch, I need a rabbit. Gratch climbed off his lap as Richard took up his bow. After the arrow was off, he told the guard to bring him the rabbit, but not to eat it. Gratch had learned to retrieve and was happy to do it. He always got what was left of the skinning and gutting. After Richard was done and had bid Gratch goodbye, he hiked back to camp. His mind wandered back to the vision of Kaylin he had had in the tower and the things she had told him. The sight of her being beheaded haunted him. He recalled her words. Speak if you must these words, but not of this vision. Of all there were but a single one born of the magic to bring forth truth will remain alive when the shadow's threat is lifted. Therefore comes the greater darkness of the dead. For there to be a chance at life's bond, this one in white must be offered to her people to bring their joy and good cheer. He knew who the this one in white was. He knew what bring their joy and good cheer meant. He thought, too, about the prophecy that Sister Verna had told him of, the one that said, He is the bringer of death, and he shall so name himself. She claimed the prophecy said that the holder of the sword is able to call the dead forth, call the past into the present. He wondered and worried what that could mean. At the camp, he found Sister Verna squatted at the fire, cooking bannock. The aroma made his stomach rumble. The sparsely wooded country was coming to life with sounds of animals and bugs heralding the dawn. Clusters of small dark birds sang from the tall, thinly foliated trees, and gray squirrels chased each other up and down their branches. Richard hung the skewer with the rabbit over the fire as Sister Verna continued to mind the bannock. I brought you some breakfast. I thought you might like some meat. She gave only a grunt of acknowledgement. You still angry with me for saving your life yesterday? She carefully laid another small stick on the fire. I'm not angry with you for saving my life, Richard. I thought you said your creator hated lies. Do you think he believes you? I don't. Her face turned so red, Richard thought her curly hair might catch fire. You will not speak blasphemy. And lying is not? You do not understand, Richard, why I'm angry. Richard sat on the ground and, grasping his ankles, folded his legs in. Maybe I do. You're supposed to be my protector, not the other way around. Maybe you feel that you have failed. But I don't feel that you failed. We both just did what we had to, to survive. Did what we must? Fine wrinkles radiated around her eyes as they narrowed. As I recall from the book, when Bonnie, Geraldine, and Jessup led the people across the Poison River, some of those people died. Richard smiled to himself. So you really did read it. I told you I did. That was foolhardy. We could have been killed taking that risk. We didn't have any choice. You always have a choice, Richard. That is what I am trying to teach you. She sat back on her heels. The wizards who created that place thought they had no choice, but they made things worse. You were using your Han back there, and you were doing it without understanding the consequences. What choice did we have? Hands on her knees, she leaned forward. We always have a choice, Richard. 
You were lucky this time that your use of magic didn't get you killed. What are you talking about? Sister Verna drew a saddlebag close and started rummaging through it, finally pulling out a green cloth bag. You got some blood from that beast on your arm. Did any of the bugs bite you? On my legs. Show me. Richard pulled up his pant legs and showed her the swollen red bites. She shook her head and, whispering to herself, pulled first one and then a second bottle from the bag. With the stick found on the ground nearby, she dipped a white paste from one bottle and wiped it onto the flat of a knife blade. She threw the stick in the fire. Taking up another stick, she dipped a dark paste from the other bottle and mixed it with the light on the flat of the blade, then spread it along the edge. She threw the second stick with some of the mixed paste on it into the fire. Richard flinched when it exploded in a white-hot ball of fire that lifted skyward, dissipating as it rose, turning to a boiling cloud of black smoke. She held up the knife to reveal a gray paste spread on the blade. Light and dark, earth and sky. Magic to heal what would otherwise kill you by tonight. You have a way of getting yourself out onto thin limbs, Richard. Each step you take only makes your predicament worse. Now come over here, closer. Richard dug his heels in and scooted around the fire. Were you trying to decide whether or not you were going to help me? Of course not. This is made from powerful magic, constructed magic, to smother the venom injected into you by the conjured creatures. Too soon and the cure would kill you. Too late, the bites would kill you. It must be the right kind of magic at the right time. I was simply waiting for the proper time. Richard wanted to argue with her, but instead said, Thank you for helping me. She frowned at him before leaning over his bites. Sister, how was I making things worse? You were being reckless. Using magic is dangerous not only to others, but to the one who calls it forth as well. Richard winced as she drew the edge across one of the bites, first one way, then the other, cutting an X on it. The sting made his eyes water. How can it be dangerous to me? She concentrated as she leaned over his leg, whispering an incantation while stroking the knife across his swollen flesh. He tried not to jump when she cut the next bite. She was only making light cuts, but they stung fiercely. It is like starting a fire in the center of a tender, dry wood. You find yourself in the center of the fire, in the center of what you have started. What you did was foolish and dangerous. Sister Verna, I was trying to stay alive. She jabbed a finger at one of the painful bites. And look what happened. If I don't heal you, you'll die. She finished with his legs and turned his attention to his arm. When we were being attacked by those beasts, you thought to save us, but everything you did only increased the danger. When she finished, she held the knife blade over the fire. A thin stream of white flame roared up from the steel, consuming the remaining paste. She held the blade to the fire until the paste and the white flame were gone. If I hadn't acted, sister, we would be dead. She shook the hot blade at him. I did not say you were wrong to act. I said you acted in the wrong way. You used the wrong kind of magic. I used the only thing I had, the sword. She pitched the knife. With a thunk, it stuck solidly in a piece of firewood. Acting without knowing the consequences of the magic you call forth is perilous behavior. Well, nothing you were doing was helping. Sister Verna rocked back on her heels, stared at him for a moment, and then turned to busy herself with replacing the bottles in the green bag. I'm sorry, sister. I didn't really mean that. It didn't come out the way I intended. I only meant that you weren't able to sense the way, and I knew if we stayed, we would be killed. The bottles clinked together as she moved them around in the bag. She seemed to be having difficulty getting them packed the way she wanted. Richard, you think that controlling the gift, using magic, is what you are to learn with us. That is the easy part. Knowing what kind of magic to use, how much to use, when to use it, and the consequences of using it, that is the hard part. That is the meaning of everything. How, how much, when, and what if, just like the magic I have put on your bites. She fixed him with a deadly serious expression. Without that knowledge, you are a blind man swinging an axe in a crowd of children. You have no idea of the danger you invoke when you use magic. We try to give you sight and some sense before you swing that axe. Richard picked at a clump of grass at his feet. I never thought about it that way. Perhaps, if anything... I should be angry with myself for being foolish. I didn't think there was anything powerful enough to tempt me into a trap. I was wrong. Thank you, Richard, for saving me. He wrapped a long stalk of grass around his finger. I was so relieved to find you. 
I thought you were dead. I'm glad you're not. She had pulled all the little bottles out of the bag and set them on the ground. I could have been lost in that spell for all time. I should have been. What do you mean? There seemed to him to be more bottles than would fit into the bag, but then he had seen them all come out. We have tried to rescue sisters before. We have seen some and their charges lost in those enchantment spells. I saw one the first time I went through. We have never been able to get them out. Sisters have died trying. She started replacing the bottles. You used magic. I used the sword. The sword has magic, you know. No, you didn't use the sword's magic. You used your Han, even though you didn't realize it. Using your Han through desire without wisdom is the most dangerous thing you can do. Sister, I think it was just the sword's magic. When you called to me, I heard you. We have tried to call to others, and they have never heard us, not once. You just didn't know how. You couldn't hear me either until I stepped through some sort of sparkling wall around you. Then you could hear me. You just have to step through that wall first. She pushed bottles to each side to make more room as she spoke softly. We know that, Richard. We have tried every sort of magic and have never been able to pass through or break the wall of one of these spells or been able to get the attention of one captured by it. No one has ever been brought out of an enchantment spell before. She replaced the last bottle and finally turned to face him. Thank you, Richard. He shrugged as he pulled the grass off his finger. Well, it was the least I could do to make up for what I did. For what you did. Richard occupied himself with carefully rolling his pants back down. Well, before I saved you, I kind of killed you. She leaned closer. You did what? You were hurting me. With your magic. With the collar. I'm sorry, Richard. I was in the spell and didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't intend to hurt you. He shook his head. Not then. Before. In the White Tower. She leaned even closer and gritted her teeth. You went into a tower? Are you mad? I told you what those towers are. How could you be so... Sister, I had no choice. We have already discussed choice. I told you how dangerous those towers are. I told you to stay away from them. Look, there was lightning all around. It was trying to strike me. I... Well, I didn't know what else to do. So I dove through an archway into the tower for protection. Can't you follow the simplest instructions? Must you always act a child... Richard looked up from under his eyebrows. Those were your exact words. You came into the tower. I was sure it was you. You were angry with me, much as you are now, and you used those exact words. He gritted his teeth as he put a finger to the collar at his neck. You used this. You used it to throw me against the wall and pin me there with it. Can this collar do that, sister? She sat much quieter. Yes. We don't have the power of a wizard. The male Han. The color amplifies our power, so we may be stronger than the one wearing it, so we can teach them. His voice was deep with anger. Then you used it to give me pain, like the pain you did for real when you were in the spell. Only it was stronger and went on and on. Can the collar do that too, sister? She pulled a clump of grass to her side and began cleaning her hands with it, avoiding his glare. Yes, but that was a vision, Richard. I wasn't really doing it. I told you to stop hurting me or I would put a stop to it. You wouldn't stop, so I called the sword's magic and broke the bond of the power holding me. You were furious. You said that I had made my last mistake. You said you were going to kill me for fighting you. You were going to kill me, sister. I'm sorry, Richard, she whispered as she looked up, that you had to suffer that. Her voice regained some of its strength. So what did you do to me, to the vision of me? He leaned over and touched the edge of his first finger to the side of her shoulder. I cut you in half with the sword right here. Her hand stopped. She was stone still. Some of the color had left her face. Finally, she regained her composure. Richard picked at the clump of grass by his foot again. I didn't want to do it, but I was positive you were going to kill me. She tossed the grass aside. I'm sure you were, Richard, but that was only a vision. If it were real, it wouldn't have turned out that way. You would not have been able to do what you did. Who are you trying to convince, sister? Me or yourself? She met his glare. The things you saw were not as they are in the real world. They were simply illusions. Richard let it drop. He turned the stick with the rabbit to cook the other side and slid the iron plate with the bannock to the side of the fire to let it cool. Anyway, 
When I saw you again, I didn't know if you were a vision or real, but I truly hoped you were alive. I didn't want to kill you. He looked up and smiled. Besides, I promised you that you would get through the Valley of the Lost. She nodded. Yes, you did. More desire than wisdom indeed. Sister, I was only doing what I could think of to survive. To help you survive, too. She sighed and shook her head. Richard, I know you're trying to do your best. But you must understand that what you think is best is not necessarily right. You're calling your Han without knowing what you're doing or even realizing you're doing it. In so doing, you tempt danger you can't fathom. How was I using my Han? Wizards make promises that their Han strives to keep. You promised me you would help me through the valley, save me. But in so doing, you have invoked prophecy. Richard frowned. I've given no prophecy. Not only given it, but used your Han without realizing it, used prophecy without knowing its form to do something in the past to aid you in the future. What are you talking about? You destroyed the horse's bits. I told you at the time why I did that. They're cruel. She shook her head. That's what I'm talking about. You think you did it for one reason, but it served another purpose. Your conscious mind is simply seeking to rationalize what your Han is doing. When we were running from the valley, I didn't believe in what you were doing, and I tried to turn my horse. Because he didn't have a bit, I was unable to. So what? She leaned closer. Destroying the bits in the past satisfied a need of a promise in the future. That was using prophecy. You're swinging the axe blindly. Richard gave her a skeptical expression. That's a stretch, sister, even for you. I know how the gift works, Richard. Richard thought about it and finally decided he didn't believe her, but decided, too, that he didn't want to argue with her about it. There were other things he wanted to know. Is your little book full? I haven't seen you writing in it. I sent a message yesterday that we have come through the valley. I have nothing else to write, that's all. The book is magic. With magic, we erase old messages. I erased all but two pages, but with what I added yesterday, there are now three pages full. Richard tore off a corner of the hot bannock. Who is the prelate? She charges the sisters of the light. She is... Her eyes narrowed. I've never mentioned her. How do you know of her? Richard licked the crumbs from his fingers. I read it in your book. Her hand flew to her belt, groping for the book. It was there where it always was. You've read my private writing? You have no right. I will... You were dead at the time. Her mouth snapped shut, and he went on. When I killed you, or the illusion of you, the book fell on the ground. I read it. The tension left her muscles. Oh. Well, that's simply part of the illusion. I told you it's not as things are in life. Richard tore off another corner of Bannock. There were only two pages with writing, just as the real book. Not until after we were through the valley did you add the third. Back then, there were only two. She watched him eating the bannock. Illusion, Richard? He looked up. One page said, I am the sister in charge of this boy. These directives are beyond reason, if not absurd. I demand to know the meaning of these instructions. I demand to know upon whose authority they are given. Yours in the service of the light, Sister Verna Sovendrine. The second page said, You will do as you are instructed or suffer the consequences. Do not presume to question the orders of the palace again. In my own hand, the prelate. The sister's face had drained of color. You had no business reading something belonging to another. As I said, you were dead at the time. What instructions did they give you about me that made you so angry? The color came back to her face in a rush. It has to do with the technicality. It's nothing you would understand, and anyway, it is not your business. Richard lifted an eyebrow. Not my business? You claim you're only trying to help me, yet you've taken me prisoner, and you say it's not my business? I have this collar around my neck, and with it you can hurt me, perhaps kill me, and you say it is not my business? You tell me I must do the things you say, that I must take them on faith, even though that faith is shaken with every new thing I discover, yet it's not my business? You tell me that the illusion I saw was not as things are in the real world, yet I find it was, and you tell me it's not my business? Sister Verna was silent. She watched him without emotion. Watched him, he thought, as if he were a bug in a box. Sister Verna, will you tell me one thing I've been wondering about? If I can. He pulled his legs up tighter under himself. He tried to keep any hostility out of his tone. When you first saw me, you were surprised that I was grown. You thought that I would be young. That's right. 
We have ones at the palace who can sense one born with the gift, but you were hidden from us, so it took us a very long time to find you. But you told me just the other day that you had spent over half your life away from the palace searching for me. If you've spent twenty-odd years looking for me, how could you expect me to be young? You would have expected me to be grown unless you didn't know I had been born and started searching for me long before anyone at the palace sensed me. Her answer came in a cautious, quiet voice. It is as you say. It has never happened this way before. So why would you have come looking for me before any of you sensed that one with the gift had been born? She chose her words carefully. We didn't know precisely when you would be born, but we knew you would be, so we were sent in search. How did you know I would be born? You are spoken of in prophecy. Richard nodded. He wanted to know about this prophecy and why they thought he was so important, but he didn't want to stray from the trail he was following at the moment. So you knew it might be many years before you found me? Yes. We didn't know when you would be born. We were only able to narrow it to a range of decades. How are the sisters who are to be sent chosen? We are selected by the prelate. You have no say in the matter? She tensed, as if suspicious she might accidentally be slipping her neck through a noose, yet was unable to keep from voicing her faith. We work in the service of the Creator. We would have no reason to object. The whole purpose of the palace is to help those with the gift. To be selected to save one with the gift is one of the greatest honors a sister may receive. So, none of the others sent have ever had to give up so many years of their lives to rescue one with the gift. No, I've never heard of it taking more than a year, but I knew this assignment could last for decades. Richard smiled to himself in triumph. He leaned back, stretching his muscles. He took a deep breath. Now I understand. Her eyes narrowed. What do you understand? I understand, Sister Verna, why you treat me the way you do. I understand why we're always fighting, why we're always at each other's throats. I understand why you resent me, why you hate me. She looked like someone waiting for the trap door to fall out from under her. I don't hate you, Richard. He nodded and pulled the catch on that trap door. Yes, you do. You hate me. And I don't blame you. I understand. You had to give up Jedediah because of me. She flinched as if a noose had just tightened around her neck. Richard! You will not speak to me and you resent me because of that. Not because of what happened to the other two sisters. It's because of Jedediah. If it weren't for me, you would be with him. You would have been with him for the last 20 years. You had to give up the love of your life to go on this accursed quest to find me. They sent you. You had no choice. You had to go. It's your duty. And it cost you your love and the children you might have had. That's what I've cost you. Why you hate me. Sister Verna sat and stared. She neither spoke nor moved. Finally, she said, The seeker indeed. I'm sorry, Sister Verna. No need to be, Richard. You don't know what you were talking about. She slowly lifted the rabbit from the fire, setting it on the iron plate with the bannock. For a moment, she stared off into nothing. We had better finish eating. We must be on our way. Fine. But I just want you to consider, Sister, that it's not by my choice. I didn't do this to you. The prelate did. You should either be angry with her, or if you're so devoted to your duty, to your creator, as you claim, then you should have joy in his service. Either way, please stop blaming me. She opened her mouth to speak, but then instead fumbled with the stopper on the water skin, finally getting it off and took a long drink. Drawing deep breaths when she finished, she dabbed her sleeve to her wet lips. Her unwavering gaze locked on his. Soon, Richard, we will be at the palace. But first we have to pass through the land of a very dangerous people. The sisters have an arrangement with them to be allowed to pass. You will have to do a task for them. You will do it, or there will be great trouble. What will I have to do? You will have to kill someone for them. Sister Verna, I promise you I'm not going to... Her index finger rose from her fist, commanding silence. Don't you dare swing the axe this time, Richard, she whispered. You have no idea of the consequences. She rose to her feet. Get the horses ready. We must be leaving. Richard stood. Aren't you going to have your breakfast? She ignored his question and stepped close to him. It takes two to argue, Richard. You're always angry with me, with everything I tell you. You resent me. You hate me because you think I made you put on that collar. But I didn't, and you know it. 
Kaylin made you put it on. It's because of her you wear the Radahan. If it weren't for you, you wouldn't be with me. That's what I've cost you and why you hate me. But I think you should consider, Richard, that it's not by my choice. I didn't do this to you. Kaylin did. You should either be angry with her, or if you're so devoted to her as you claim, then have joy in carrying out her wishes. Perhaps she has valid reasons for them. Maybe she has your interests at heart. Either way, please stop blaming me. Richard tried to swallow, but couldn't. Chapter 37 the blood-red light of day's death oozed through the bones of trees lining the spine of the next ridge. Her green-eyed gaze left the well-hidden places where outposts of sentries were stationed. They were too far apart, she noted, or she would not be standing unnoticed where she was. She tallied the men in rank upon rank of tents, marching up the valley floor below. Five thousand would be generous, she concluded. Horses were picketed to her left near supply wagons all neatly lined up. To the far side of the valley, latrines had been dug in the snow. Cook wagons, stationed between the men and the supply wagons, were packing up for the night. Colorful battle flags flew over the command tents. It was probably the most orderly army she had ever seen afield. Galeans did have a penchant for order. They look very nice, Chondolin said in a quiet voice. Four men about to be slaughtered. The two brothers gave nervous chuckles of agreement. Kalin nodded absently. That morning, they had seen the army these men were chasing. They were not neat, they were not orderly, they were not pretty, and their sentries were not stationed too far apart. Still, Chandelin and the two brothers had managed to get her close enough to see what she had wanted to see, and to take a tally. She had guessed their numbers at 50,000, and that was not being generous. She let out a long breath, its thin white cloud drifting back in the cold air. I have to stop this. She hiked her pack and bow up on her back. Let's get down there. Chondolin, Prindon, and Tosidon followed behind as she slogged down the hillside of fluffy snow. It had taken her longer than she had hoped to catch these men. A blizzard high in Jara Pass had left the four of them holed up in the shelter of a wayward pine for two days. Wayward pines always reminded Kaelin of Richard, and as she had lain in her fur mantle, listening to the howl of the wind, she had dreamed of him while she slept and while she was awake. She was furious that she had to lose valuable time on the way to Aidendril to stop this army from their suicide pursuit of the forces that had destroyed Ebenissia. But as the mother confessor, she couldn't allow nearly 5,000 men to die to no purpose. She had to stop them before they got close to the army that had plundered Ebenissia. They were too close now. They would surely make contact by the next day. The army sprang to alert as the four figures in white wolf pelt mantles marched toward them. Shouts erupted and were repeated back through the ranks. Tent flaps were flung open and men poured out. Swords were drawn, sending the ring of steel into the cold twilight air. Men with spears came running through the snow. Men with bows took up positions, knocking arrows. A wall of several hundred men put themselves between her and the command tents. More were coming at a run pulling on clothes, shouting to others still in their tents. Kaelin and the three men with her came to a halt. She stood tall and still. Behind her, Chondolin, Prindon, and Tosidon leaned lazily on their spears. A man of rank tumbled out of the largest tent as he pulled on a heavy brown coat. He made his way through the wall of men, shouting at the archers to hold their arrows. He was joined by two others of rank as he stumbled through the line of defenders. She recognized his rank as he approached. He was the captain. The two men with him, one to each side, were lieutenants. When he drew himself to a panting halt before her, she let the hood of her mantle drop back. Her long hair fell across the white fur. What is the... The captain's eyes went suddenly wide. He and the two lieutenants collapsed to a knee. Every man, as far as she could see, fell to his knees. Every head bowed. The rustle of wool, the creak of leather, and the clang of steel fell silent. The three men with her cast one another glances of wonder. They had never seen the mother confessor greeted by anyone but mud people before. The only sound was the slow creak of branches in the cold breeze. Rise, my children. Accompanied by the renewed racket of movement, all came to their feet. The captain stood and gave her a smart bow from the waist. He came up with a proud smile. Mother confessor, what an honor. Kalen stared in disbelief at his square jaw his wavy light brown hair, his clear blue eyes, 
his young, handsome face. You're a child, she whispered. She looked around to the hundreds, the thousands of young, bright eyes all fixed on her. She blinked at them. She could feel the blood going to her face. Her fists tightened as she shook with rage. You're children! You're all children! The captain glanced back to his men with an embarrassed expression bordering on hurt. Mother Confessor, we're new recruits, but we're all soldiers of the Galean army. You are all children, she whispered. Children! Silence swept over the gathered recruits. Most looked to be 15 or 16 years. The captain and his two lieutenants shifted their weight and hung their heads. Some of the men couldn't help staring openly at Chandalin, Prindon, and Tosidon. They had never seen anyone like them before. Kalin grabbed the captain's lapels and began dragging him off. She growled to the two lieutenants. You two come along with us. She glared over her heads. Everyone go back to what you were doing. There was a rattle of swords being returned to scabbards and arrows to quivers as she dragged the captain out of earshot of his men. When she reached the trees, she pulled him toward a log and released him with an angry shove. Kalin flopped down on a snow-covered log as if it were a throne. She folded her arms. Chandalen stood to her right, Prindon and Tosidon to her left. They planted the butts of their spears and waited in silence. She gritted her teeth. What is your name, Captain? He fumbled with a brass button on his open coat. I'm Bradley Ryan. His blue eyes came up. Captain Bradley Ryan, Mother Confessor. He quickly glanced away to the man at his right. This is Lieutenant Nolan Sloan, he pointed to the other side. This is Lieutenant Flynn Hobson. How many children do you have along with you, Captain Ryan? He stiffened a little. Mother Confessor, we may be younger than you, although not by much, and you may not think highly of us, but we're soldiers, good soldiers. Good soldiers. She was hardly able to keep herself from screaming at him. If you're such good soldiers, why was I able to walk unnoticed through your line of sentries? His face reddened, and he made a visible effort to remain silent. And is there a one of these good soldiers, including you three, that is beyond 18? He pressed his lips tighter and shook his head. Then I repeat, how many children do you have along with you? There are four and a half thousand under my command. And do you know, Captain Ryan, that you are about to stumble upon a force ten times your size? Captain Ryan lifted an eyebrow, and a little boy grin grew out of one side of his mouth. We're not about to stumble upon anyone, Mother Confessor. We're about to catch them. We've been chasing them. I think we'll have them tomorrow. She gritted her teeth anew. Have them? Tomorrow, if I hadn't caught up with you, young man, you and all your men would die. You have no idea of the army you are about to catch. He lifted his chin. We know what we are chasing. We have scouts, you know. I get reports. Kaylin shot to her feet, thrusting her arm to the right and pointing. There are 50,000 men around that mountain. 52,000 and several hundred, he shrugged. We're not stupid. We know what we're doing. Her arm dropped as she glared. Oh, you do, do you? And just what were you going to do once you caught them? Captain Ryan smiled as he leaned in, sure that he could prove to her that he indeed did know what he was doing. Well, they're about to come to a divergence in the pass. I'm going to send a force up there around them to come in from each fork. They'll think they're being attacked by a large force. We're going to drive them back this way, where we're going to be waiting for them, beyond the narrows just ahead. Then we're going to retreat back this way to the narrows, then split the flank, let them in, until they have nowhere to go. The pikemen will be bunched in the narrowest place. They're called the anvil. Arches to the sides will hold the enemy to the center. The force driving them is called the hammer. His grin widened. We'll crush them in the middle. He flicked his hand in a casual manner as he straightened a little. It's a classic tactic. It's called the hammer and anvil. Dumbfounded, Kalin stared at him. I know what it's called, young man. The hammer and anvil is a bold maneuver under the right conditions. Against a force ten times your size, it's beyond foolhardy. You are a badger trying to swallow an ox whole. We were taught that with good timing and determination, a small force of good men in a tight place like this valley... Good men? You think that's going to count with the spirits? Is that what your pride and presumption leads you to think? The captain's eyes descended to the ground. You can't push a boulder with a stick. The only way to move them back this way is to frighten them into moving back. She thrust her arm out, pointing off toward the enemy again. Those are experienced, battle-hardened men. 
They have been fighting and killing for a good long time. Do you think they don't know what a hammer and anvil is? Do you think that just because they're the enemy, they are stupid? Well, no, but I think... She jabbed a finger at his chest as she cut him off. Do you want me to tell you what's going to happen, Captain? You don't have enough men to push them. When you send that detachment around them, they will accommodate you and move a little. And as they do, they'll wing out to let your force in. That's called a nutcracker. Guess who the nut is? But they will move. For your anvil, they will be hounds roused to the scent of blood. After they've wiped out your hammer, there will be nothing to contain them, nothing to keep their flanks from wheeling as they drive in. They have battle experience and know exactly what to do. They'll split your pikemen and their archers and cut them off from their supporting swordsmen. A flying wedge protected by shields will drive into those pikemen. Crescents to the sides will trap them. Their armored cavalry will come at a full charge and rake down your wings of archers, who will by then have no pikemen to blunt the charge. You will all fight bravely, but you will be outnumbered perhaps twenty to one, because you've already sacrificed part of your force to be the hammer, and they will all be dead by then. To fight a larger force, you must divide them and conquer them one bit at a time. Instead, you will have done the opposite. You will have divided yourself in half for them, so they can kill half at a time at their leisure. The captain stood his ground. We can make a good show of ourselves. You don't know how good we are. We're not novices. Every one of those children under your command will die. Have you ever seen anyone die, Captain? Not die like an old man in bed, but in battle? You will be run through with spears, shot through the eyes with arrows. Swords will hack off arms, split open ribs. Blades will rip your bellies open and spill your guts across the cold ground. Faces you know, your friends, these children will look up at you in panic as they choke on their own blood and vomit. Others will be screaming for help as your enemy moves through the wounded on the ground and eviscerates them to make them suffer a gruesome death. The ones who surrender will be executed while your enemy dances and sings about the great battle they have just won. Captain Ryan's head finally rose. His lieutenant still stared at the ground. You sound like Prince Harold, Mother Confessor. He has given me close to the same speech on a number of occasions. Prince Harold is a smart soldier. Captain Ryan buttoned two of the brass buttons on his dark brown wool coat. But that doesn't change my decision. Of all our choices, the hammer and anvil is the best chance we have against them. I believe we can make it work. We must. Chandelin leaned toward her and spoke in his tongue. Mother confessor, these men are the walking dead. We should be away from them so we do not get caught in their foolishness. They are going to die to a man. The captain frowned. What did he say? Kalin leaned close to the young captain. He says you are all going to die tomorrow. Captain Ryan looked Chandelin up and down. What does he know about battle? He's just a savage from the wilds. Kalin lifted an eyebrow. Savage? He's a pretty smart man. He speaks two languages, his and ours. Captain Ryan swallowed. And he has fought in battles. He has killed men. How many men have you killed, Bradley? He glanced to his two lieutenants. Well, none, I guess. Look, I'm sorry, I meant no offense, but I know about war. And what do you know about war, child? She whispered. We're all volunteers. Myself three years ago. Almost no man here has less than one year. We've all trained hard. Prince Harold himself has worked with us, taught us tactics. We've won mock battles against him several times. We may be young, but we have experience. We were sent on this expedition as a final test before our assignments. We've been afield nearly a month practicing war games and battle tactics. We know what we are about. Just because we're young, that doesn't mean we can't fight. We may be young, but that also means we're strong. Chandelin laughed. Strong? You travel like women. He cleared his throat when Kalin lifted an eyebrow to him. Well, some women. You are not so strong as you think. You are soft. You have wagons to carry your needs. That makes you soft. You will die tomorrow. Kalin turned back to the three soldiers. My friend is wrong. You are not going to die tomorrow. The captain brightened. We're not? You believe in us then? She shook her head. You are not going to die tomorrow because I will not allow it. I'm sending you back. You are to take your division back to your command unit. That captain is an order. I'm on my way to Aidendril to take care of this. I will put a stop to that army of killers. Captain Ryan's expression hardened. We have no command to return to. They were wiped out in Epinesia. That was where we were training, but we were out on maneuvers. We have the trail of the ones who did it, and we are going after them. 
Those soldiers in Epinicia were many times your number, and they were crushed by the force you chase. We know. Those were men we lived with, ate with, slept with. They were our teachers. They were our brothers, our fathers. They were our friends and companions. He shifted his weight and cleared his throat in an effort to keep his voice steady. We should have been there with them. We should have been there to stand with them. Kaelin turned her back to the three Galean soldiers. She put her fingers to her temples, closing her eyes as she rubbed in little circles. She had a headache from the worry of these young men all being slaughtered. She grieved for the friends of these men, friends and comrades who were killed defending their city. The faces of the young women floated before her mind's eye. Kaelin spun around, looking into the eyes of the young captain. Eyes, she realized, that had seen more than she had at first thought. You were the one, she whispered. You were the one who closed the doors. You closed the doors in the palace, the doors on the rooms of the queen and her ladies. He swallowed and then nodded. His blue eyes were wet, his lower lip quivered. Why would they do that to those poor people? Kaelin answered in a gentle tone. The object of a soldier is to make his enemy do foolish things, either by making them too frightened or too angry to think. They do it to strike fear into your hearts, but more than that, to make you so angry you will do something foolish so they can kill you too. Those men we chase are the ones who did that. We have no command to return to. It's upon us now. That is the foolish thing they want you to do. You will not. You will go to another command. You are not going to attack that army. Mother Confessor, I am a soldier sworn to serve Galia and the Midlands. In my life, young though you think it is, I've never once entertained the idea of disobeying my commanders, my queen, or the Mother Confessor. Captain Ryan lifted his wrist with his finger and thumb and placed them on his shoulder. But in this, I must disobey your orders. If you wish, you may take me with your power, but I will not otherwise do as you say. Lieutenant Sloan spoke up for the first time. And then you will have to take me because I'll take his place and lead our men to the fight. Lieutenant Hobson stepped forward. And then you will have to take me. After the three of us, Captain Ryan said, you will have to move through the officers and then every one of the men. If there is one left, he will attack and die in battle if need be. She drew her hand back. I'm going to the Central Council and will take care of this. What you want to do is a suicide. Mother Confessor, we are going to attack. For what? For glory? You want to be heroes avenging the murdered? You want to die in a glorious battle? No, Mother Confessor, he said in a quiet tone. We saw what those men did to Epinicia. We saw what they did to the soldiers they captured. We saw what they did to the women and children back there. Many of the men under my command had mothers and sisters back there. We all saw what was done to them and what was done to our fathers and brothers, our people. He drew himself up tall and straight as he looked with resolve into her eyes. We're not doing this for glory, Mother Confessor. We know it's a suicide mission, but we're all single. We have no families to leave without fathers. We're doing it because those men will go on to another city and do to them what they did in Epinicia. We're doing this to stop them, if we can. Our lives are sworn to protect our people. We cannot shirk our responsibility. We must attack and try to stop these men before they kill any more innocent people. I pray to the good spirits that you succeed in Aidendrill. But still, that will take too long. How many more cities will be plundered before you can bring the Midlands to bear on these men? One city is too many. We're the only ones in contact with these killers. Our lives are all that stand between them and their next victims. When I took the oath to serve, I swore that no matter the choices, no matter the orders, I would always put the protection of my people first. That's why I must disobey your orders, Mother Confessor. Not for glory, but to protect the defenseless. I wish to have your blessing in this, but I will try to stop those men with your blessing or without it. She sank to sit on the log again and stared off into the distance, pondering the three soldiers. The six men waited in silence. Children indeed. They were older than she had thought. And they were right. It would still take her some time to get to Aidendrill and more time yet to raise armies to hunt down these killers. In the meantime, they would go on killing. How many would have to die waiting for help from the Central Council? She wished she could be anyone right now but who she was, the Mother Confessor. She disregarded her feelings and considered the problem as the Mother Confessor must. She weighed lives, those spent and those spared. Kaelin stood and turned to Chandelin. We must help these men. Chandelin pushed his hands farther up on his spear and leaned toward her. Mother Confessor, 
These men are foolish children, and they are going to die. If we stay with them, they will bring a storm of killing around us. We will be killed with them. They will die just the same, and you will not reach Adendril. Chandelin, these boys are like the mud people. They are chasing their Jacopo. If we don't help them, then more will die like we saw back in the city. Prindon leaned in. Mother Confessor, we will do whatever you wish. But there is no way to help these boys. We are only four. Tosidon nodded. And then you would fail in your duty to reach Adendril. Is that not important? Of course it is. She pulled some hair back off her face. But what if the army who killed everyone in that city were going next to the mud people? Would you not want me to help if it were your people they would murder next? The three men straightened. They twisted their spears while they thought, glancing over her shoulder occasionally to the three soldiers who also stood silently. What would you do to defeat this enemy? She asked as she moved her gaze among the three, if you had to. At last, Tosidon leaned in again. There are too many. It cannot be done. Chandelin angrily backhanded Tosidon's shoulder. We are mud people fighters. We are smarter than these men who ride in wagons and murder women. Do you think them better fighters than us? The two brothers shuffled their feet as they averted their eyes. Well, Prindon said, we know that the way they want to do it will only get them killed. There are better ways. Chandelin smiled. Of course there are. The spirits taught my grandfather how to do such things. He taught my father, and my father taught me. The numbers may be larger, but it is the same problem. We know better than these men what to do. He looked Kalin in the eye. You too know better than these men what to do. You know you must not fight the way the enemy wants. That is what these men are about to do. Kalin smiled at him and nodded. Maybe we can help these men protect other innocent people. She turned to Captain Ryan. He had been watching her speak in a foreign tongue with the three strange men. All right, Captain. We are going to go after this army. He gripped her shoulders. Thank you, Mother Confessor. He jerked his hands back, realizing with a fright that he had actually touched her. He instead rubbed his hands together. It will work. You'll see. We'll have the jump on them. We'll surprise them and have them all on a pike. She leaned toward him. He backed away. Surprise them? Surprise them? She grabbed him by his collar and pulled his face close. They have a wizard, you idiot. The captain's face paled. A wizard? He whispered. She released his collar with an angry shove. You were at Epinicia. Didn't you see the hole melted through the wall? Well, I guess I didn't pay attention. I only saw the dead. His eyes darted about as if seeing them now. They were everywhere. She cooled at the pained expression on his face. I understand. They were your friends and family. I can understand why you wouldn't have noticed. But that is no excuse for a soldier. A soldier must notice everything. Missing details can get you killed, Captain. This is a good example of a little detail that would have done you in. He swallowed and then nodded. Yes, Mother Confessor. Do you want to kill the men who destroyed Epinicia? The three soldiers spoke up that they did. Then I am taking command of this legion. If you want to stop the men who are up there, then you will do as I say, and as Chandelin, Prindon, and Tosidon say. You may know about battle tactics, but we know about killing people. This is not a battle, Captain. This is killing people. We are only going to help you if you really want to stop those men. If you are interested in having a battle, then we will leave you right now so you can get yourselves slaughtered. Captain Ryan fell to a knee. The two lieutenants followed his example. Mother Confessor, it would be my greatest honor to serve under you. You have my life and the lives of every one of my men. If you know how to stop those men from murdering any more people, we will do whatever you ask. She nodded down to the three men. This is no war game, Captain. For us to win, every man must do as he is ordered. Anyone who doesn't do as we order is aiding the enemy. That is treason. If you want to stop those men, then you all are going to have to turn command over to me. And you can't change your mind if the task becomes grim. Do you understand? Yes, Mother Confessor, I understand. She looked to the other two. And you? I am honored to serve under you, Mother Confessor. As am I, Mother Confessor. Kaylin motioned them up and then drew her fur mantle closed. I must get to Aidendrill. It is of the utmost importance, but I will help you begin this. We will tell you what must be done. I can give you only a day or two. We will help you begin the killing, and then we must be on our way. Mother Confessor, what of the wizard? 
Kaylin looked at him from under her eyebrows. You leave the wizard to me. Do you understand? He is mine. I will handle it. All right. What do you want us to do first? Kaylin walked between the captain and one of the lieutenants. The first thing you have to do is get me a horse. Chondolin leapt forward and gripped her arm, slowing her as to put his head close to hers. His tone was angry with suspicion. Why do you want a horse? Where are you going? She came to a halt, pulling her arm free. She took in all six men. Do you have any idea what it is I'm about to do? I'm about to choose sides. I am the mother confessor. If I choose sides, I choose sides for all the Midlands. I commit all the Midlands to war. She met Chandelin's eyes. I cannot do that on the word of these men. Chandelin erupted in fury. What more proof do you need? You saw what they did back at that city. What I saw does not matter. I must know why. I cannot simply declare war. I must know who these men are for whom they fight. She had another reason to go, a more important reason, but she didn't speak it. They are killers. You've killed people. Would you want others to know the reason before they sought vengeance? You foolish woman! Prindon put a cautionary hand on Chandelin's arm, attempting to bring a little prudence to Chandelin's words. Chandelin angrily wrenched his arm away. You say these men are foolish and they have thousands. You are one. You have no chance to escape if they decide to kill you. I'm the mother confessor. None may lay a weapon to me. She knew it was an absurd pretext, but she had to do this and could think of no other justification to allay his fears. Chandelin was too angry to speak. He finally turned away with a growl. She knew that in the past he would have been angry because if she were killed, he couldn't return home. She thought that perhaps now he was genuinely afraid for her. She didn't like the idea either, but had no choice. She was the mother confessor. She had a duty to the Midlands. Lieutenant Hobson, please get me a horse, a white or gray if you have one. He nodded and ran off to do as asked. Captain, I want you to get all your men together and tell them what's happening. Chandelin stood with his back to her. She stroked a hand down the white fur over his shoulder, over his father's bone knife. You are fighting for the Midlands now, not just the mud people. He let out an angry grunt. While I'm gone, I want you three to start explaining to these men what must be done. I hope to be back before dawn. When she saw Hobson returning with the horse, her knees tried to buckle. Dear spirits, what had she gotten herself into? She turned to face Captain Ryan. If I'm... If anything... She took a breath and started again. If I get lost and can't find my way back, you're to take your orders from Chandelin. Do you understand? You're to do as he says. Yes, Mother Confessor, he said in a quiet tone as he put his fist to his heart in salute. May the good spirits be with you. From my experience, I'll take a fast horse instead. Then you have your wish, Lieutenant Hobson said. Nick is fast, and he's fierce. He won't let you down. The captain cupped his hands, giving her a boost up onto the big war horse. She looked down at the men as she gave the gray an introductory pat on his neck. Nick snorted and tossed his head. Before she lost her nerve, she pulled the big stallion around and urged him toward the slopes, toward a trail that would circle her around to come into the enemy camp from the other side. Chapter 38 The snow-crusted trees loomed all about her in the eerie light. The moon would be down soon, but for the time being it gave the snow a luminescence that made the way easy to see. As she trotted her horse into the open valley, she was almost glad to be free of the pressing trees that could hide anyone intent on ambush. She made no attempt to conceal her approach, and the sentries saw her, but they made no move to stop a lone rider. Ahead, the army's camp was alive with fires, men, and noise. As large as a small city, it could be spotted easily and heard from miles away. Confident in their numbers, they feared no attack. With the hood of her fur mantle pulled up and drawn close around her face, Kaelin walked Nick among the confusion of men, wagons, horses, mules, tents, gear, and roaring fires. She sat tall on her horse, and above the din she could almost hear her heart thumping. The strong aroma of roasting meat and wood smoke filled the still air. The snow had been trampled and packed flat by tens of thousands of men, both man and beast, and by wagons of every sort. Men were gathered around fires, drinking and eating and singing. Pikes were stacked upright in circles, leaning in, with their heads all resting together in bristling cones. Lances were everywhere, sticking up from snowbanks, looking like forests of stripped saplings. 
tents sprouted all about without any order to their layout. Men roamed far and near, stumbling from one fire to another to try the food, to join in song around men with flutes, to gamble at dice, and to share the drink. Sharing the drink seemed to be what occupied most of them. No one paid any attention to her. They seemed too preoccupied to notice her. She kept her horse at a trot and passed the ones who did stare up before they had a chance to wonder at or confirm what they had seen. The whole place seemed to be an uproar of activity. Her war horse didn't so much as flinch at the pandemonium all about. From some of the tents in the distance, she heard the screams of women, followed by the raucous laughter of men. Despite her attempt to stop it, a shiver ran down her spine. Kayla knew that armies like this one were accompanied by prostitutes who rode along in the supply wagons with other camp followers. She also knew that armies like this one took women as part of their plunder, considering them a simple privilege of victory, much as taking a ring from a dead man and worth little more. Whatever the reasons for the screams, feigned delight or true terror, she knew she could do nothing about it, and so tried not to hear them, turning her attention instead to the men she passed. At first she saw only Daharan troops, she knew their leather and mail and armored uniforms all too well. Each of the breastplates bore an ornate embossed letter R for the House of Rawl. Soon, though, she was able to pick out Keltons among the Daharans. She saw one group of a dozen men from Westland, each with an arm around the next fellow's shoulders as they danced in a circle and at the same time drank from mugs. She saw men of other lands, too, a few from the Kobaris, some Sandarians, and to her horror, a handful of Galeans. Maybe she thought they were simply Daharans in the uniforms of men they had killed. Somehow she didn't believe that. Sporadic quarrels were going on throughout the camp. Men argued over a lay of the dice, food, casks, or even bottles of drink. Some of the disputes erupted into fights with fists and knives. She saw one man stabbed in the gut to the uproarious laughter of onlookers. At last she spotted what she was looking for, the tents belonging to the commanders. Though they hadn't bothered to put up their flags, she knew by their size what they were. Outside the largest, a small table had been set up next to a roaring fire with spitted meat over it. Lanterns on poles surrounded the group of men gathered there. As she approached, a huge man who sat with his feet up on the table was yelling, And I mean right now or I'll have your head. A full one. You bring a full cask or I'll have your head on a pike. When the soldiers scurried off, the table of men erupted in laughter. Kaylin brought her huge warhorse right up to the edge of the table. She sat tall and still as she appraised the half-dozen men sitting around the table. Four were Daharan officers. The one with his boots resting on the table had been the man who had been yelling. One was a Keltish commander in an ornate uniform unbuttoned to reveal a filthy shirt soaked with wine and meat drippings. And one man wore plain tan robes. With a large knife, the man with his feet up on the table carved a long strip of meat from a bone. He tossed the bone over his shoulder to a snarling pack of dogs behind him. He tore the strip of meat in half with his teeth and pointed with the knife to his right, to the young man in plain robes, as he added a swig from a mug to the meat already in his mouth. He spoke around it all. Wizard Slagle here told me he thought he smelled a confessor. He peered up with bloodshot eyes. And where is your wizard confessor, huh? Everyone at the table laughed with him. Ale ran down his thick blonde beard. Bring anything to drink, confessor? We're nearly out. No? Well, not to mind. With the knife, he pointed over to the Keltish commander. Karsh here tells me there's a nice city a week or so down the mountains, and they're bound to have some ale for us thirsty boys after they welcome us to their town and swear allegiance. Kalin's eyes slid to the wizard. It was for him she had come. She coolly calculated whether or not she could make the jump from the horse to the wizard and touch him with her power before she was caught by that big knife. The man wielding the knife didn't look to be able to react too quickly. Still, she judged it to be poor odds. She was willing to give her life to the task, but only if she could be reasonably sure of success. But it was for him she had come. The wizard was this army's eyes. He saw things before they could, and things they couldn't see, like her. And Aharans feared things magic and spirits. A wizard was their defense against magic and those spirits. Her gaze moved from the wizard's deep-set eyes and drunken leering smirk to what he was doing with his hands. He was whittling. Before him on the table was a pile of shavings. She remembered the piles of wood shavings in the palace at Epinicia, outside the girls' rooms. 
The wizard waggled the stick he had whittled. For the first time, she noticed what it was. It was a larger-than-life phallus. His smirk grew. The man with the knife pointed it to the wizard. Slagle's got something for you, confessor. Been working on it for two hours since he realized you were coming for a visit. He made a feeble attempt to hold back his laughter, but it came in fits through his restraint, and he finally gave in to it. Two hours. They had just told her the limits of this wizard's power. She had left the Galeans four hours ago, but nearly an hour of that had been spent at her task up on the ridges. That meant the Galean boys weren't yet close enough for the wizard to know of them, but were only concealed from discovery by a dangerously thin margin. Any closer, and the wizard would know of them, long before they could bring any surprise to bear. She waited for the Daharan man's laughter to sputter out before she spoke. You have me at a disadvantage. Not yet, but I will, the men roared and hooted again. With every beat of her heart, she became more calm. She pushed her hood back. She wore her confessor's face. What is your name, soldier? Soldier? He lurched forward and stuck the knife on the table. I'm no soldier. I'm General Riggs. I'm supreme commander of all our troops. All our men, old and new, answer to me. And in whose name are you fighting, General Riggs? He swept his hand around. Why, the Imperial Order is fighting a war on behalf of those who join us. A war against all the oppressors, against all who fight us. Those who don't join us are against us and will be crushed. We fight to bring order. Under the Imperial Order, all who join us will find protection, and in turn they will help protect all. All the lands will join with us or they will be swept aside. It is a new order for which we struggle. The Imperial Order. They command all the lands and I command them. Kalin frowned, trying to make sense of what she was hearing. I am the Mother Confessor and I command the Midlands, not you. Mother Confessor? He clapped the wizard on the back. You didn't tell me she was the Mother Confessor. Well, you don't look like any mother I've seen. But after tonight, you'll be a mother sure enough. You have my word on that, he roared with laughter. Darken Rahl is dead. That brought the laughter to an end. The new Lord Rahl has declared the war ended and called all the Daharan troops home. General Riggs rose to his feet. Darken Rahl was a man of limited foresight, a man too much concerned with his ancient magic and too little concerned with order. He was too preoccupied with his own quests, his old religions. Magic until it is eradicated is a tool of men, not a master of them. Dark and Rahl failed to use the opportunity he had. We will not fail. Dark and Rahl himself in the underworld knows this and repents. He is allied to our struggle now. The good spirits have declared it. We no longer bow to the house of Rahl. But they, as all houses, districts, and kingdoms to us, the new Lord Rahl will join us too, or will crush him and any heathen dogs who follow him. We will crush all the heathen dogs. In other words, General, you fight for no one other than yourself. Your purpose is simply to murder people. I do not fight for myself. This is a larger purpose than one man. We offer all the opportunity to join with us. If they don't join with us... It's because they're aligned with our enemies, and we must kill them. He threw his hands up. It's useless trying to explain such matters of state and canon to a woman. Women have no intellect for rule. Men have no exclusive talent to rule, General. It's profanity for men to bow down to a woman for protection. Right men concern themselves only with getting under a woman's skirts, not with hiding behind them. Women rule from their nipples, offering only their sympathetic pap. Men rule from their fist. They make and enforce the law. They provide and protect. Every king and patrician will be offered the chance to join with us, to bring his land and his people under our protection. All queens will be offered the chance to ply their wares in a brothel, or perhaps to be the humble wives of an indentured farmer, but either way make a proper use of themselves. He swept his mug up from the table and took a few gulps. Can't you see, woman? Are you that stupid even for a woman? What has your Midlands Alliance accomplished under the rule of women? Accomplished? The Alliance is to accomplish nothing but to let all the lands live in peace, to leave their neighbors' lands to their neighbors, and know that their own is safe from covetous hands and that all will stand to protect each. 
even the weak and defenseless, so none will stand alone and naked. He smiled in triumph as he looked to his comrades. Truly spoken from the teat, he gestured with disgust. You provide no leadership, no law. Each land prescribes and pronounces as they see fit. What in one place is a crime in another is virtue. Your alliance shies from bringing order to all. You are nothing but fragmented tribes, each jealously guarding what's his with no thought of the union other than fits their own greed, and in so doing, let's all be vincible. You are wrong. That is exactly what the Central Council in Adendril is for, to bring all lands together for the common defense, the common defense against murderers like you. It is not a feeble union, as you seem to think, but one with teeth. A noble ideal. One, in fact, which I share, but one you only give pap to. You bring them together only timidly, not under common cannon. He held his hand out to her, closing it into a fist as he leered at her. In so doing, you leave all lands ripe for the squeezing. You are lost souls in search of true leadership and in desperate need of protection. As soon as the boundaries fell, you were ravaged by Dark and Rall, and he was only half-hearted about it, seeking only his magic. Had he let the generals run as they would, there wouldn't be even a shell of this play alliance of yours left. And who is it we all need protection from? He stared off, whispering almost to himself. From the horde who will come. What horde? He looked up, as if he had just awakened. The horde spoken of in the prophecies. He frowned at her, as if she were hopelessly thick, and then held his hand out to the wizard. The good wizard here has counseled us on the prophecies. You are one who spent your life with wizards, and you never sought their knowledge? Your eloquent claim to want to join people in peace and law are high-minded words, General Riggs. But your atrocities in Ebenissia put the lie to them. For all time, Ebenissia will bear mute but irrefutable testimony to your true cause. You and your imperial order are the horde. Kalin glowered to the wizard. What's your part in this, Wizard Slagle? He shrugged. Why, to assist and facilitate the joining of all people under the rule of common law. Whose law? The law of the victors, he smiled. That would be us, the Imperial Order. You have responsibilities as a wizard. Those responsibilities are to serve, not to rule. You will report at once to Aidendril to take your place in that service, or you will answer to me. You! he said with a derisive sneer. You demand that good and decent men whimper and snivel before you, and at the same time you blindly let banelings have a free run of the land. Banelings? She glowered at Riggs. I suppose you would be foolish enough to seek counsel from the blood of the fold. They've already joined with us, General Riggs said offhandedly. Our cause is theirs and theirs ours. They know how to expunge those who would serve the Keeper and thus our enemies. We will cleanse the land of all who serve the Keeper. Goodness must triumph. You mean your cause. It is you who would rule. Are you blind, Confessor? I rule here now, but this is not about me. It's about the future. I simply fill the post for now, furrow the field so it may produce. It is not I who is the focus. We offer everyone the chance to serve with us, and every man with me has taken that offer. Others have joined our troops in our battle. We are no longer the Haran troops. They are no longer troops of their homeland. We are all the Imperial Order. Any of right mind can lead us. If I fall in our noble struggle, another will rise up to take my place. Until all the lands are joined under united rule, and the Imperial Order can flower. Either the man was too drunk to know what he was saying, or he was mad. She glanced about at the dancing, drunken, singing men at campfires all about. Mad as the Bantak. Mad as the Jokopo. General Riggs. He had been muttering angrily under his breath, but stopped and looked up at her. I am the Mother Confessor. Like it or not, I represent the Midlands. In the name of the Midlands, I call upon you to halt this war immediately and either return to Dahara or come to the council with your grievances. You may petition the central council with any dispute you have, and it will be heard, but you may not visit war upon my people. You will not like the consequence, 
if you choose not to heed my orders. Page 400. He sneered up at her. We make no compromises. We'll annihilate all who don't join us. We fight to stop the killing, to stop the murdering, as the good spirits have called upon us to do. We fight for peace. Until we win peace, we will have war. She frowned. Who told you this? Who told you that you must fight? He blinked at her. It's self-evident, you stupid bitch. You cannot possibly be so stupid as to think the good spirits tell you to wage war. The good spirits do not act in such overt ways. Ah, well, then we have a disagreement. That is the purpose of war, is it not? To settle such matters? The good spirits know us to be in the right, else they would easily join against us. Our victory will prove they side with us or we could not win in our struggle. The Creator himself wishes to see us triumph, and our victory will be proof of that. The man was a lunatic. She redirected her attention to the Keltish commander. Karsh? General Karsh. You demean the rank, General. Why did you slaughter the people of Epinicia? Epinicia was given the opportunity to join us, as we'll all be given the opportunity. Epinicia chose to fight. We had to make an example of her heathen people to show others what awaits them if they fail to join us in peace. It cost us nearly half our men, but it was a goal worth the cost. Even now, those lost are being replaced by others joining with us, and we will swell in rank to take in all the known lands. This you call leadership? Extortion and murder? General Karsh slammed his mug down on the table. His eyes were fire. We visit upon them what they visit upon our people. They raid our farms, our border towns. They kill Keltons as if we were bugs to be stepped on. Yet we offered them peace. It is they who chose to shun our mercy. They were offered a chance at peace, a chance to join us. They chose war. In that way, they chose to aid us. They've made an example for others of the folly of fighting us. And what have you done with Queen Cyrilla? Did you slaughter her too, or is she back there in your horror's tents? They all laughed. She would be, Riggs put in, if we'd found her. Kaelin almost sighed aloud with relief. She looked back to Karsh, who was taking another swig. What has Prince Fyron to say of this? Fyron's an aid in drill. I'm here. So, perhaps the crown wasn't a part of this. Perhaps this was little more than a band of murdering outlaws who fancied themselves as more. Kaelin knew Prince Fyron, knew him to be a reasonable man. Of the Keltish diplomats assigned to Aedendril, he was the one who had done the most to bring Kelton forward into the alliance of the Midlands through the Central Council. He cajoled and persuaded his mother, the Queen, to go the route of peace rather than conflict. Prince Fyron was a gentleman in every sense of the word. Besides being a murderer, General Karsh, you are also a traitor to your own land and crown, to your own queen. He hammered his pewter mug down on the table. I'm a patriot, a protector of my people. She leaned the slightest bit forward. You're a treasonous bastard and an outlaw cutthroat without conscience. I leave to Prince Fyron the honor of condemning you to death. It will, of course, be a posthumous sentence. Karsh pounded his fist. The good spirits know of your treachery against the people of the Midlands. This proves their words true. They've told us we cannot be free as long as you live. They've called upon us to kill all those like you, all those who blaspheme. The good spirits will not abandon us in our struggle. We shall defeat all who do the Keeper's bidding. No real officer, she said contemptuously, would listen to the babbling of the blood. The wizard had made an angry-looking ball of liquid fire and was slowly juggling it back and forth between his hands while he watched her. The flames spit and hissed, dropping little sparks. General Riggs belched and then put his knuckles on the table as he leaned toward her. Enough talking. Get down here, you little wench, so we can start the party. Us brave freedom fighters need a little fun, General Karsh at last smiled. And then tomorrow, or perhaps the next day, you will be beheaded. Our men, our people, will rejoice at your death. They will exult in our triumph over the Mother Confessor, the symbol of oppression by magic. His smile left as he turned red-faced once more. The people must see your punishment and know that good can prevail, to have hope. When we have your head, our people can rejoice. Rejoice? 
that all you brave freedom fighters are strong enough to kill a single woman? No, General Riggs said. He appeared for the first time sober as he looked up at her. You miss the true meaning of what we do. You fail to see its significance. His voice lowered, his tone softened. It's a new age we enter, Confessor, an age that has no place for your old religions. The line of confessors and their wizards is at an end. There was a time 3,000 years ago when nearly everyone was born with the gift. Magic held sway over all things. That magic was used to vie for power. Wizards abused their power. In their greed, they killed one another. They killed others who had the gift, and so fewer lived to pass it on. Over time, those with the gift were culled from the race of men. Yet those left still contested for rule and further thinned the ranks of those born with the gift. The magic, the other creatures of magic who wear their charges, such as you, have been steadily stripped of their protection and fount of magic. Today, there are almost none born with the gift. Magic itself is dying with them. They have had their chance to rule, just as did Dark and Rawl with his magic, and they have failed. Their time, the time of wizards, is past. Their protection of the twilight beings is at an end, and so the age of magic is at an end. The time of man is upon us now, and there is no place in that world for the ancient dying religion you call magic. It is time for a man to take his place as inheritor of the world. The imperial order is upon the world now, and if it were not them, it would be man by another name. It is time for man to rule, for magic to die. Kalin felt a sudden hollowness. An unexpected tear ran down her cheek. A choking feeling of true panic clawed at her throat. Do you hear that, Slagle? She whispered hoarsely. You have magic. The ones you aid would put an end to you, too. He tossed the little ball of fire to his other hand, the light of its flames dancing across his grim face. It is as it must be. Magic, chaste or foul, is the keeper's conduit to this world. When I have helped extinguish magic in all its forms, then I too must die. In that way, I will serve the people. Riggs gazed up to her, almost sorrowfully, as he went on. Our people must see the last living embodiment of that religion die. You are its symbol, the last creature of magic created by wizards. With your death, they will be filled with hope for the future and be emboldened to extinguish all the remaining pockets of filth and perversion that are magic. We are the plowshare. Those lands now infested with magic will be freed of its taint and can be resettled by pious people. Then at last we shall all be free of your dogmas, which have no part in the glory of the future of man. He straightened, taking a drink from his mug. The harshness returned to his voice. After we finish with you, then we'll bring Galia to heal and the rest of the lands. He slammed the mug down. Until complete and total victory is ours, we demand war. Rage swelled in her, banishing the momentary sensation of loss and panic. Swelled on behalf of all those beings, the twilight beings, who depended upon her for voice and protection. She nodded slowly as she held the general's gaze. In my capacity as Mother Confessor, the highest rank of authority in the Midlands, to whose mandate all must bow, I grant your wish. She leaned forward and spoke in a hiss. Let there be war. On my word and office, not one of you shall be granted quarter. Kalin's fist came up to the wizard. It was for him she had come. Her chest heaved with wrath and with terror at the madness of these men. She let the magic surge within her, demanding release, demanding this wizard's death. It was for him she had come. She must not fail. The blood rage screamed through her. She called the lightning forth. Nothing happened. She froze for an instant in the panic of the failure of the magic. Then Riggs lunged for her leg. Kalin hauled back on the reins. The ferocious warhorse sprang into battle. He bellowed as he reared, kicking his front legs. Kalin grasped his mane for dear life. A lashing hoof caught Riggs across the face, throwing him back. The thrashing hooves crashed down on the table, shattering it to splinters. Men in chairs toppled backward. Nick's front hooves crushed the head of one of the Daharan officers, the leg of another. The horse spun and kicked at the men. 
Kaylin gave him her heels, and he leapt into a gallop as the wizard was rising to his feet. Surprised men threw themselves out of the way. She took a quick glance over her shoulder to see the wizard throwing his hands out. A ball of wizard's fire exploded to life before him, turning in the air, awaiting command. He threw his arms out again, sending the fire on its way toward her. The warhorse leapt over fires and men, kicking up both snow and flaming firewood. His legs caught tent lines, yanking them down. Kalin spotted what she wanted, what she wanted more than life itself, and maneuvered the horse for it. She could hear the wail of the wizard's fire coming for her. She could hear the screams of men unexpectedly caught up in it. She stole another glance to see the blue and yellow ball of flame tumbling through the tents and men, growing all the time, taking a course as drunken as the wizard. Wizard's fire had to be guided, and in his state, the wizard was having difficulty controlling what he had wrought. Were he sober, she would be dead by now. Dear spirits, she prayed, if I'm to die, let me have time enough first to do what I must. Kaylin reached her goal. As she galloped past, she yanked a lance from a snowbank and wheeled her horse. She dug her heels in, and Nick leapt ahead at a full gallop. The ball of fire wailed toward her, setting tents and men afire. It grew and tumbled as the distance closed. The lance was unexpectedly heavy, made for men who had more muscle than she, and she had to carry it upright to save her strength. The warhorse didn't flinch as he galloped, not at the noise, the confusion, the running men, or the wizard's fire. She pulled to one side and then the other, Nick's hooves digging into the packed snow. She dodged obstacles, weaving her way toward the wizard's fire at full speed, toward the wizard. Slagle tried to change the course of the fire to block her advance, each time she wove in her headlong rush. His reactions were slow, but as the distance closed, she knew he wouldn't need to be fast to catch her up in it. At the last instant, she wheeled her horse around to the right. The fire roared by so close she could smell burnt hair, and then she was racing again. As she charged the horse ahead, the wizard's fire exploded behind, cascading across the ground like a burst dam. The horrifying death screams of man and beast caught in the conflagration filled the night air. Dozens of men, all afire, rolled through the snow trying to put out the flames. But wizard's fire was not so easy to extinguish. It was alive with purpose. The howls of pain panicked those around who didn't know what was happening. Men screamed in fear of spirits they thought were setting upon them. Swords were drawn and wielded, hacking at those running for their lives from the fire. Battle erupted out of nothing. The air carried not only the choking stench of burning flesh, but now blood. She ignored the screams and sought the silence within. The wizard stumbled backward and fell. He came to his feet, whirling his arms. Fire formed in the air at the arc of his fingertips. Though there was confusion all about, only one thing filled her vision, the wizard. She couched the lance, tucking the base under her right armpit, jamming her grip tight against the leather stop. Gritting her teeth, she used all her strength to lift the heavy lance over Nick's bobbing head to the left side so as not to unbalance herself in the saddle. Nick took her direction as if he could read her mind. She steered him at full speed, but it seemed to her that the last ten yards took hours, a race between her charge and the wizard calling forth fire. Wizard Slagle looked up to direct the fire just as her lance caught him in the chest. The impact shattered the lance to splinters at mid-length and nearly tore the wizard in half. She and her horse flew through a spray of blood. Kalin swung the half-lance at a man lunging for her, catching him across the head. The impact tore the lance from her grip. She wheeled the horse and leaned forward over his withers as she galloped at full speed back through the confusion around the command tents. Her heart pounded as fast as the horse's hooves. One of the Daharan officers from the table was up and screaming for a horse. Men leapt onto horses bareback. As she began putting distance between them, she could hear him yell that if they failed to catch her, they would be drawn and quartered to a man. A quick glance showed a good three dozen riders joining the chase. Away from the command tents, back the way she had come, men didn't know what was happening and saw a galloping rider as simply part of the drunken festivities. None moved to stop her. Men, tents, fires, pole arms, and lances stuck upright in the snow. Stacks of pikes, horses, and wagons all flashed by in a blur. Nick jumped anything he couldn't dodge. The threat of him not jumping or dodging had men diving for cover. Men at games tumbled out of the way, coin and dice flying into the air. Tents pulled up when their lines crossed Nick's legs, flew up, and billowed in a tangle behind, catching up her pursuers. 
Horses and riders crashed to the ground. Others ran over their own men in their frenzied attempt to keep her in sight. Kalin spotted a sword hanging in a scabbard that was fastened to the side of a wagon, and as she ran past, she pulled it free. Galloping past picket lines, she swung the sword, cutting the lead lines. She hacked the rump of one horse as she charged past. He kicked and screamed in fright and pain, panicking the rest of the horses. They bolted headlong in every direction. Lanterns on poles toppled onto tents, setting them afire. The horses in pursuit balked at the fires, rearing and bucking, throwing their riders to the ground. A man lunged suddenly into her path, avoiding Nick's flying hooves and grabbing for her. Kaylin drove the sword home through his chest as she flew by. The hilt tore from her hand. She leaned forward and held on as Nick raced through the endless camp. The men chasing weren't as close, but they were still coming. Suddenly, she was free of the camp, galloping through the open snow. Kaylin followed her own tracks across the flat by the waning light of the moon. The muscular horse plowed through the snow almost as if it weren't there. She reached the trees at last, and before plunging in and ascending the steep slopes, she checked over her shoulder. A good fifty men were not three minutes behind. She would be able to open the lead as she went up along the forest trail, but they would still catch her. She would see to that. Chapter 39 Easy now, she cautioned. One hesitant hoof slipped. Back, back, back. Come on, boy, back. From down the slope behind, she could hear the sounds of the chase. A man, probably one of the Daharan officers, yelling angrily at the top of his lungs not to let her get away, and others urging their horses up the steep trail. When they reached the flat where she was, they would be in a full gallop again. Kalin tugged gently on the reins. Nick lifted his hoof from the ice and backed up into the tight gap between the snow-crusted pines back along his trail. She found the long branch with the forked end she had whittled to a pushing pole, stuck upright in the snow where she had left it beside the twin-trunked spruce. She hefted it up and started pushing the heavy snow-laden branches. Her shoulder ached from having the lance shattered as she held it under her arm. As she backed Nick between the trees, off her trail, she held the long push stick out over his head, jostling the limbs. Relieved of their loads, they sprang up, partly screening the gap between the trees. More importantly, the snow tumbled to the ground, piling over her tracks. She pushed at a branch here, another there, sprinkling their snow over Nick's backing trail, covering it in, making it look natural, as if wind had simply freed the branches of their load. She said a silent thank you to Richard for teaching her about tracks. He had said he would make a woods woman of her. She ached for Richard. She was sure he wouldn't approve of the desperate risk she was undertaking with the aid of what he had taught her but she couldn't allow these men to track her back to the Galean boys. There was a chance that some would carry word of what they had seen back, and then the Galeans would be slaughtered. If none of these men returned, it would be a long while before any more were sent, if ever. Even if they were, by then it would be too late. She would have long been up and over the passes from which she had come, where the wind howled and drifted the snow constantly, and her tracks would be lost to them. They would not know where she had gone. From there, the mountains and forests went on in endless tracts, and her trail would have been last seen leading steadily away from her true destination. Those back at camp would have confidence that these soldiers would have her sooner or later, and with the prospect of plunder only days away, they would turn their attention to it instead. The snow-muffled thundering of hooves brought her mind back to what she was doing. The men had reached the flat and were charging at full speed again. Steadily, she worked her way back into the trees, shaking branches, covering her trail, backing toward the way she had come on her way to the army of the Imperial Order. The sounds of chase were almost upon her. Kalin leaned almost all the way over, stroking an arm along her horse's neck. She whispered toward his ears, and they swiveled back to the sound of her voice. Quiet now, Nick. Please don't move or make a sound. She stroked his sweaty neck again. Good boy. Quiet now. It sounded to her as if anyone would be able to plainly hear her heart beating in her chest. The pursuers had reached her. As they charged along her trail right in front of her, they broke through the screen of trees to her left, not ten yards away, at full speed. Kalin held her breath. She heard the clop of hooves as they hit the sloping ice hiding in the moon shadows beyond those trees, beyond her false trail. She had led her tracks between those trees to the edge of a steep rocky stream, 
where its water would tumble were it not frozen over a cliff. It was a small stream, but as it froze, more water had bubbled and frothed over that which was already frozen, growing the area into an ice palace. Snow had been washed away as it fell, leaving the rounded, downward-sloping humps of ice bare and slick. As the men broke through the trees, they had not twenty feet to halt their headlong rush before the cliff's edge, before the rock and ice halted and only thin air lay beyond. And they had to do it on cascading mounds of ice. Were it flat ice, like a lake, the horses could have dug their iron shoes in and tried to skid to a halt, but this was not flat. It was water-slicked tumble-down ice, and as they slipped and slid and tripped and fell at a charge, they had no chance. Kalin could hear the pop of horses' legs breaking as thousands of pounds of muscle moving at full speed could not be stopped by hooves catching in crevices. The bareback riders were helpless passengers. The men shouted encouragement to their mounts, and the ones behind didn't recognize quickly enough the change in shrieking from anger to fright. Those behind crashed into those ahead, tumbling over and past each other. Bareback, with only halters and no aggressive battle bits, the riders didn't have the control they were accustomed to and were carried helplessly forward. Some leapt from their mounts as they came through the trees and could see what lay ahead, but their momentum was too great, the distance too short, their fate beyond retrieval. The horses behind, their leg bones snapping, crashed down atop the ones already fallen, who were desperately grasping for a hold. There was none. It became a waterfall of living flesh cascading over the edge. Kaylin sat still, wearing her confessor's face, as she listened to the screams of man and horse mingled together into one long wail as they disappeared over the mountainside. In the span of mere seconds, it was finished. More than fifty men and their mounts had plunged to their deaths. When the night had been silent for a time, she dismounted and circled around to keep her false trail free of any off-leading tracks to the edge of the ice floe. In the dim light, she could see the dark stains of blood over the ice mounds, blood from broken legs, blood from cracked skulls. There were none of the enemy left on the cliff. As she turned to leave, she heard low grunts of desperation. Kaylin pulled her knife and carefully inched her way to the source of the sounds toward the edge. Grasping a stout limb, she leaned out over the slanting ice floe. Forest debris was frozen in the ice. Sticks and leaves had made a small dam at the edge to be covered over as the ice grew. It left a few branches sticking out of the wall of ice. Around one of these branches were clutched fingers. A man clung by his fingertips to the branch, his legs dangling over a drop of close to a thousand feet. He was grunting with effort as he tried to catch his feet up on the ice, but it was too slippery to give him any toehold. Kalin stood at the edge, holding the branch for support, as she watched him shivering. Dribbles of water bubbled over the ice, over his face, matting his hair and soaking his Celtish uniform. His teeth chattered. He looked up to see her standing over him in the moonlight. Help me! Please help me! He couldn't have been past her age. She regarded him without emotion. He had big eyes, the kind of eyes young women would surely have swooned over. But the young women in Epinicia would not have swooned when they saw those eyes. In the name of the good spirits, help me! Kalin squatted down closer to him. What is your name? Juan. My name's Juan. Now please, help me! Kalin lay down on the ice, hooking a foot around a tangled root, taking a good grip on the stout spruce limb with one hand. She extended her other hand part way out, but not far enough for Juan to reach. I will help you, Juan, on a condition. I have sworn no mercy, and none shall be granted. If you take my hand, I will release my power into you. You will be mine now and forever. If you are to live, it will be as one touched by a confessor. If you would think to pull me over the edge with you before I can release my magic, let me assure you I would not make the offer were there that chance. I have touched more men than I can count. You will have no time. You will be mine. He blinked icy water dripping down on him from his eyes, shook it from his face, and stared up at her. Kaelin extended her hand toward him. From now on, Juan, either way, your old life is ended. If you live, it will not be as who you are now. That man will be gone forever. You will be mine. Please, he whispered, just help me up. I won't hurt you. I swear to let you be on your way. It would take me hours to make it back to camp on foot, 
and you'll be long gone by then anyway. Please, just help me up. How many people in Epinicia did you hear beg for their lives? To how many did you grant mercy? Her words came as cold as the ice she lay on. I am the Mother Confessor. I have proclaimed war without quarter on the Imperial Order. The oath stands as long as one of you lives. Choose, Juan. Death or to be touched by my power. Either way, who you are dies. The people of Epinicia got what they deserved. I'd rather take the hand of the Keeper himself than be touched by your filthy magic. The good spirits would never accept me to them if I were touched by your dark and profane magic. His lip curled in a sneer. To the Keeper with you, Confessor. Juan threw his arms open and silently dropped away into the darkness. As she rode back to the Galean recruits, she thought about the things Riggs, Karsh, and Slagle had told her. She also thought about the creatures of magic living in the Midlands. She thought about the beautiful land of the Night Wisp, with open fields deep in ancient remote forests, where the wisps gathered at twilight to dance together in the air above the grasses and wildflowers like joyous fireflies. She had spent many a night lying on her back in the grass as they hovered above her and spoke with her of things common to all life, of dreams and hopes, of loves. She thought about the creatures living in Long Lake, translucent things, hard to see, seeming almost made of liquid glass, or of the water that was their home, with whom she had never spoken, but whom she had watched emerge at night to bask in the moonlight on rock and shore, creatures who had no voice, but with whom she had shared understanding and had promised to protect. She thought about the whispering tree people, whom she had spoken with in a hauntingly beautiful experience, frighteningly eerie, but somehow gently peaceful at the same time. The whispering tree people were all joined as one, through their roots touching under the earth, and each spoke as if they were all but one, as if there were no individuals, yet each had a name to whisper to you, if you made it promises of simple favors. A mass community that was at the same time all only one. To cut down a tree there would be to bring the pain of that one's death to all. They could not escape the contact they felt with each other. If people went into that land and cut down the trees, it would be torture to all. Kalin had seen them in pain before. Their wails could make the stars cry. There were other creatures, too, that were magic, and people, too, who possessed it. Sometimes it was hard to place a line between creatures of the wild and people. Some people of the Midlands were part creature, or perhaps some creatures were part people. They were strange and delightful and very shy. And so it went throughout various forms of magic, from the simplest things in the howling caves that could let you peek through solid rock to see their nests, to people like the mud people, who had only simple magic that would do but one thing. As Mother Confessor, all these and many more were her charges. And as Mother Confessor, she commanded all to protect these magic places so no one people would bear the brunt of burden against others. It was an arrangement backed by confessors and wizards extending back for thousands of years. The Twilight Beings, Riggs had called them. That was the name given to these magical creatures by the blood of the fold, among others, because many of them came out only at night. For this reason, the blood associated them with darkness, and so, out of fear, with the darkness of the Keeper of the Dead. The blood considered magic the force through which the keeper extended his influence into this world, into the world of the living. The blood were as unreasonable and thick-headed as any men alive, and they considered it their duty to send to the land of the dead any who they thought served the keeper. That was just about anyone who disagreed with their view of things. In some lands, the blood were outlawed, and in some, like Nicobaris, they were encouraged and paid by the crown. Maybe Riggs was right. Maybe she should have brought the rule of law to stop men like this. But that had never been the intent of the council, to make all to bow and all things to one. The strength and beauty of the Midlands was in its diversity, even if some of that diversity was ugly. What was ugly to one was beautiful to another, and so it was that each land was to be left to rule itself, as long as it brought no force of arms to another. It was a tolerant suffering of things repugnant to allow things beautiful to blossom. It was a sometimes difficult and fine line to hold the council to, forcing lands to work together in some things, but allowing them to be autonomous in others. But perhaps Riggs was right. People in some lands suffered the cruel or poor rule of their greedy or inept leaders, with no hope of matters being brought to change from without. 
though the wise but smaller lands had not to live in fear of outside conquest. If the suffering of the people under less fortunate rule could be ended with wise central rule, would not matters be improved? Yet when all lived under the same rule, every other form of existence was extinguished, never to have the chance to grow, though one of them might have been a superior way. The kind of single rule the imperial order represented was slavery. Kalin was surprised to encounter Galean sentries farther from their camp than before. They were no longer spread too far apart, and they were well hidden, popping up with drawn bows and bared steel when she was almost upon them. Chandalin, Prindon, and Tosidon had obviously been at work. The sentries put fists to hearts when they recognized her. The dawn was turning the sky to a dark steel gray. It was warmer than it had been, with the clouds covering the land like a warming quilt. She was dead tired in the saddle as Nick plodded through the snow toward the camp. But as she came into sight of men rushing about, she came alert with the thoughts of what needed to be done. Chandelin, Prindon, Captain Ryan, and Lieutenant Hobson were speaking with a group of men when they saw her riding toward the camp. The four came at a run to meet her at the edge of the activity. Men were cooking, eating, stowing gear, preparing weapons, and tending to wagons and horses. She spotted Tosidon in his white wolf mantle off some distance with Lieutenant Sloan, waving his arms in explanation as he talked to men who stood mute, with their spears all standing upright in the snow, the tight mob of them looking like a dark porcupine against the white ground. Kalin let out a weary moan as she dismounted before the four men who had come to greet her. Other men all around kept to their tasks, but moved more slowly as they watched her with great interest. The four before her stared openly with wide eyes. None said a word. What are you all staring at? She said, a little short-tempered. Mother confessor, Captain Ryan said. You're covered in blood. Are you hurt? Kaylin stared down at the white wolf fur of her mantle, only it was no longer white. She realized for the first time that the skin of her face was tight with dried blood, her hair stiff with it. Oh, she said in a quieter tone. It's all right. I'm fine. Chandelin and Brynden sighed with relief. Lieutenant Hobson, still wide-eyed, swallowed. What of the wizard? Did you see him? She lifted an eyebrow to him. What you see on me is what's left of him. Chandelin appraised her with a sly smile. And how many others did you kill? Kalin gave a tired shrug. I was awfully busy. I didn't take the time to count. But all things considered, I would guess, including the fires, well over a hundred. The wizard is dead. That's what matters. Two of their commanders are dead also, and at least two more are wounded. Captain Ryan and Lieutenant Hobson paled. Chandelin's proud grin widened. I am surprised you left any for others to kill, Mother Confessor. She didn't return his smile. There are plenty left. Kalin rubbed her horse's nose. Nick did most of the work. I told you he wouldn't let you down, Mother Confessor, Hobson said. That he did not. He was better aid than the good spirits. He kept me alive this day. Kalin lowered herself to one knee in the snow before the two Galean officers. She bowed her head. I find I must beseech your forgiveness. She took a hand of each in hers. Though you are ignorant of how to accomplish what must be done, you have put your duty to the Midlands before my orders. That was courage of the highest order. I want you all to know I was wrong. You acted of noble intent. She kissed each hand. I laud your righteous hearts. You have kept in mind your duty above all else. I beg you, forgive me. There was silence as she knelt on one knee. At last, Captain Ryan whispered down to her. Mother Confessor, please get up. Everyone's watching. Not until you forgive me. I want everyone to know you did the right thing. But you didn't realize what we were doing or why. You had only our safety in mind. Kalin waited, and he was silent in embarrassment a moment longer. All right, I forgive you. Don't do it again. She came to her feet, releasing their hands and giving them a small, humorless smile. See that that is the last time you ever disobey me. Captain Ryan nodded in earnest. I will. He shook his head. I mean, no, I won't. I mean, I... We will do as you command, Mother Confessor. I understand what you mean, Captain. She let out a tired sigh. We have a lot of work to do before we attack those men. We... Chandelin shouted. We were only to teach them some things, and then we are to be on our way to aid and drill. We cannot become caught up in this battle. You have already taken enough chances. We must... Kalin interrupted him. 
I must talk to you three. Bring to Sidon. Captain, please collect the men, including the sentries. I want to speak to you all together. Please wait with your men. I will be with you shortly. And leave a tent up for me. I need a few hours' sleep while things are being prepared. She walked off a ways out of earshot of the camp, with Chandelin in tow, as Prindon went to get to Sidon. When they were all together, she turned to them. Chandelin was scowling. The other two waited without emotion. The mud people, she began in a soft tone, have magic. We have no magic, Chandelin argued. Yes, you do. You do not think of it as magic because you were born with it, and it is the only way you know. You do not know of other peoples, of their ways. The mud people can speak with their ancestors' spirits. They can do this because they have magic. You think this is simply the way things work, but they do not work so in other places with other people. Your ability to do these things is magic. Magic is not some strange and powerful force. It's simply the way some people, some creatures are. Others can speak with their ancestors if they wish, Chandelin said. A few can, but most cannot. To them, it's speaking with the dead, and that is magic, frightening magic. You and I know it is not to be feared, but you will never convince others that what you do is good. They will always think it evil. People believe as they were raised, and they were raised to believe that talking to the dead is evil. But our ancestor spirits help us, Prindon said. They never bring harm. They only bring help. Kalin laid a hand on his shoulder as she looked to his worried eyes. I know. That's why I help to keep others away from you, so you may live as you wish. There are a few other people who talk with their ancestors, as you do, and they too have this magic. There are other peoples and other creatures that have magic different from you, but just as important to them as yours is to you. She looked to each. Do you understand? Yes, Mother Confessor, Tosidon said. Prindon nodded his agreement. Chandelin grunted and folded his arms. The important thing, though, is not if you believe what you have can be called magic. The important thing is for you to understand that others believe what you do is magic. Many fear magic. They think you are evil because you practice this magic. Kalin pointed in the direction of the army of the Imperial Order. Those men, the ones we chase, the ones who killed all the people back at the city, they are joined in a cause. They wish to rule all the people of the Midlands. They do not want any to live as they wish, but to bow to their rule. Why would they wish to rule the mud people? Prindon asked. We have nothing they would want. We stay to our lands. Chandelin unfolded his arms and spoke softly. They fear magic, and they wish us to stop speaking with our ancestors. Kalin squeezed his shoulder. That's right, but more than that, they think it's their duty to the spirits they worship to kill you all. They are on a mission to destroy all who have magic, because they think magic is evil. They believe people like you have magic. She met Chandelin's eyes. If they are not killed to a man like the Jokopo, sooner or later they will come and destroy the mud people just as they destroyed the city of Epinicia. The three men studied the ground in thought. She waited for them to weigh her words. Chandelin at last spoke. And they would kill the other people? Those who wish not to have outsiders come to them to live alone like the mud people? They would. I spoke with the men of that army. They are like crazy men. They sound as if they have been visited by evil spirits, like the Bantak did, like the Jokopo. They will not listen to reason. They think we are the ones who listen to evil spirits. They will do as they promise. You saw the city they destroyed and the size of the army defending it. It is not an empty threat. I must get to Aidendril so I can raise an army to fight these men. The counselors should already be doing that, but I must get there to make sure the extent of the threat is known, to make sure all of the Midlands joins together in this. But there are no forces at hand to fight these men, now, except these boys. There are cities that will be destroyed before help can arrive. Worse, the threat these men pose will convince some to join with them. Some see honor as an inconvenience and will side with the army they think will win. This will swell their ranks further. Before Aidendril can send troops to find and defeat these men, many will die. We must call upon these boys to join the fight now, before more innocent people are slaughtered. These boys volunteer to become fighters like you, to protect their people, the people of all the Midlands. We must help them in this. 
We must not let this army of evil men escape to wander the Midlands, killing and destroying and winning more to their side. We must begin the battle with these boys. Help them. Show them. To make sure they will know how to fight and to know they will continue without us to lead them. We must lead them into the first battle to give them confidence in the ways we teach them before we can be on our way to aid and drill. Chandelin gave her a level look. And you will call the lightning to help us? No, Kalin whispered. I tried last night, but it didn't come. It's difficult to explain to you, but I believe that because I invoked this special magic on behalf of Richard, it will not work except to protect him. I'm sorry. Chandelin unfolded his arms. Then how did you kill so many? Kalin patted his arm where the bone knife was. The same way as your grandfather taught your father and he you. I did not do as they expected. I did not fight their way. The two brothers leaned in intently as she spoke. They like to drink, and when they're drunk, they don't think so well, and they are slow. Tosidon pointed behind with a thumb. These men, too, like to have drink at night. They have a wagon of it among their supplies. We would not let them have any. Some were angry. They said it was their right. Kalin shook her head. These boys also thought it would be right to march right up to an enemy who outnumbers them ten to one and have a battle in broad daylight. We must help them in this. We must teach them what to do. They do not like to listen. Prindon glanced back over his shoulder at the men he had been trying to teach. They wish always to argue. They say, this is the way it is done, and we must do it so. They are filled only with the way they were taught and do not like to be told another way. Yes, that's what we must do, Kalin said. We must lead them in the way that will work. That's why I need you three. I need you to help me in this, or many people, including eventually the mud people, will die. I need your help in this. I must lead them into battle. Chandelin stood mute and unmoving. The two brothers pushed snow with their feet, considering. Prindon finally looked up. We will help. My brother and I will do as you ask. Thank you, Prindon. But it's not you who must decide. Chandelin must be the one who agrees. It is for him to decide. The two brothers took sidelong glances at him as he stood glaring at her. At last he let out an exasperated breath. You are a stubborn woman. You are so stubborn you will get killed if we three are not there to bring some reason to your head. We go with you to kill these evil men. Kalin sighed with relief. Thank you, Chandelin. She bent and took up a handful of snow, using it to scrub the dried blood from her face. Now I must go and tell these boys what they must do. She shook the snow from her hands when she had finished with her face. Did you three get any sleep last night? Some, Chandelin said. Good. After I speak with them, I need to get a few hours sleep. You can begin showing them how to travel without their wagons. We must teach them to be strong like you. We will begin the killing tonight? Chandelin gave a grim nod. Tonight. Chapter 40 Kalin climbed atop a wagon before the assembled men. They stood in brown wool coats, packed tightly together before her in the gray morning light. Captain Ryan, with his two lieutenants flanking him, stood at the front of the men. He leaned an arm on the wagon wheel, waiting. Kalin looked out at all the young faces. Boys. She was about to ask boys to die. But what choice did she have? Dear mother, she wondered, is this the reason you chose Wiborn as my father, to teach me what I am about to do? I'm afraid I have only one bit of good news for you, she began in a quiet voice that carried through the cold air, out over the faces all watching her. And so I will give you that first, to give you courage for the other things I have to tell you. Kalin took a deep breath. Your queen was not killed in Epinicia, nor did the men who attacked the city find or capture her. Either she was away when the attack came, or she escaped. Queen Cyrilla lives. The boys seemed to take a deep breath, as if hoping she wouldn't add anything more, and then they erupted in wild cheering. They threw their arms in the air, shaking their fists at the sky. They yelled and hooted with joy and relief. Kaylin stood in her blood-soaked wolf mantle, her hands at her sides, letting them have their time of celebration and hope. Some of the boys, forgetting for the moment that they were soldiers, hugged each other. She watched tears of happiness run down many a cheek as men leapt and shouted. 
Kaylin stood feeling small and insignificant as the mob of boys poured out their adoration for her half-sister. She couldn't bring herself to halt their rejoicing. At last, Captain Ryan climbed up onto the wagon next to her. He held his arms up, calling for silence. All right, all right, hold it down. Stop acting like a bunch of children in front of the mother confessor. Show her what men you be. The cheering finally died out, to be replaced by grins and bright eyes. Captain Ryan clasped his hands together and cast her a somewhat sheepish look before taking a couple of steps away atop the wagon to give her room. The people of Epinicia, she went on in the same quiet tone, were not so fortunate. The winter silence became brittle. Light breezes rustled icy branches on the trees ascending the slopes to either side of the flat valley pass holding their camp. The grins withered. Every one of you, at the least, had friends who were murdered there. Many of you had loved ones, family, who died at the hands of the men a few hours up this pass. Kaylin cleared her throat and swallowed as her eyes found the ground. I, too, knew people who died there. Her eyes came up. Last night I went to their camp to discover who they were and if they could be called upon to return to their homelands. They have no intention of doing anything but conquering all the lands and putting them under their rule. They have vowed to kill everyone who refuses to join them. Ebenicia refused. The boys shouted and shook their fists. They themselves, they said, would bring an end to the threat. She spoke over their words, bringing them to silence as she did so. The men who slaughtered your countrymen and countrywomen are called the Imperial Order. They fight on behalf of no country or land. They fight to conquer all lands and to rule all lands. They answer to no government, to no king, to no lord, to no council. They believe themselves to be the fountain of law. They are made up of mostly Daharan men, but others have joined them. I saw among them Keltons. Waves of angry whispers swept back through the crowd. Kalin let it go on for a moment. I saw also among them men from other lands, and I saw Galeans. This time, shocked and angry voices called out that it wasn't true and said she was wrong. I saw them with my own eyes. They fell once more to silence. She quieted her tone. I wish that it were not true, but I saw them. Men of many lands have joined with them. More men will join with them if they believe they can be part of the victory, part of the new law, if they believe they can be in on the plunder and awarded positions of authority and power. The city of Selian lies hardly more than a hand of days ahead. The imperial order will have their surrender and allegiance or their death. Other cities, towns, villages, and farms will suffer these men if they are not stopped. Eventually, all will come under their sword. I am going to Aidendril to marshal the forces of the Midlands against the imperial order, but that will take time. In that time, their numbers will swell with those who would think to be on the side of might. Right now, there is no one able to stop these men from killing everyone in their path who resists them. Except you. Kaylin stiffened her back as she let what she had said sink in, and in preparation for what she was going to tell them next. She let the silence settle once more over the valley. As the mother confessor of the Midlands, and absent the luxury of conferring with the Central Council, I have had to do that which no mother confessor for a thousand years or more has had to do. On my authority alone, I have committed the Midlands to war. The army of the Imperial Order is to be killed to a man. No negotiation or compromise will be offered by the Midlands. Under no circumstances will the Order's surrender be accepted. I have given an oath on behalf of the Midlands that no quarter shall be granted. Astonished faces stared at her. Whether I live or die, this decree is irrevocable. Any land or people who willingly join with the Imperial Order cast their lot under the shadow of this edict. It is not in the name of Galia that I call upon you to fight. In the office of the Mother Confessor, I call upon you to fight for the Midlands. For it is not Galia that is under threat, but all lands and all free people. There was confident grumbling that they were up to the task. Some in the ranks called out their assurance that they were the men to do it, that they were in the right and would triumph. Kalin nodded to them all. You think so? I want each of you to look to the faces around you. They mostly stared at her. Do as I say. Look to all the faces around you. Look to your comrades. A little confused, they began looking around, twisting to see those to the sides and those behind, smiling and laughing among themselves, as if it were a game. 
when they seemed to have finished with the task, she went on. A few of you will remember the faces you have looked upon today. Remember and grieve. The rest, if you take up this battle, will not be around to remember. They will die in the struggle. In the cold silence, Kalin heard the distant chatter of a squirrel, and then the sound of that too died away. The smiles were all gone as she finally spoke again. These men, the Imperial Order, are led by and are mostly Daharan troops. Daharan soldiers are trained from the time they are half your age. They fight internal conflicts in their land, put down riots and rebellions. They do not simply practice battle tactics, they live them day in and day out. They know only a life of fighting. They have been exposed to it in every form. I have taken the confessions of many Daharans. Most do not know the meaning of peace. Since spring, when Dark and Rahl sent them against the Midlands, they have been at what they do best, war. They have fought in battle after battle. All who have come before them have fallen. They relish fighting. They delight in it. They are as close to fearless as men come. They hold contests, often lethal, to win the right to be in the van of battle, to win the right to be the first to strike a blow at the enemy, to win the right to be the first to fall. She surveyed the young faces. You have confidence in your training, your battle tactics? The faces nodded, looking to one another, smiling their knowing confidence. Kalin pointed to one, a sergeant by the look of his coat's braids. Tell me then, you are now in the field of battle, having chased down these men, and here comes the enemy, back at you. You are in charge of the pikes and archers. Here they come, thousands of them, yelling, running, coming to rend your force in two to break your armies back. You see they have heavy spears, called by them argons, with long, thin barbs. If they pierce you, they are nearly impossible to remove. They cause ghastly wounds that are almost always fatal. Here they come with their argons, thousands of men. What is your tactic? The young man held his chin out knowingly. Form a tight rank of the pikes, formed into a box or wedge to protect the archers. The pikemen face the pikes out and overlapping the shields. Present the enemy with a tight, impenetrable wall. The shields protect the pikemen who protect the archers. The archers take them down before they can get close enough to use their argons. The few who do fall on the pikes. Their drive is repelled, and in all likelihood they have lost a good many men in the failed attempt, making another less likely. Kalin nodded as if impressed. Well stated, he beamed. The men around him grinned with pride in their knowledge of their business. I have seen some of the most experienced armies of the Midlands use those very same tactics when the Daharans first came over, last spring when the boundary went down. Well, there you have it, the man said. They lose their charge against the archers and on the point of our pikes. She gave him a small smile. The Daharan van, those men I told you about, the biggest, the fiercest, the ones who won the right to be the first at you, well, they've developed special tactics of their own for use against your plans. First of all, they have arrow shields, so as they run in, they're protected from the brunt of the archer's work. And I guess I forgot to tell you one other thing about those argons of theirs. These spears have iron-sheathed shafts for most of their length, and a unique purpose. As the enemy is charging in, mostly unaffected by your archers, they heave their argons at you. We have shields, the man pointed out. Their argons expended, they will be on the point of our pikes. She folded her arms, nodding to him. The van, the men who won the right to be the first wave, are big men. I doubt the smallest has arms less than twice the average of yours. The argons are needle sharp. Thrown by those powerful arms, they penetrate and stick in your shields. The long barbs prevent them from being withdrawn. The confident smiles were fading as she looked from face to face as she went on. You now have argons stuck solidly in your shields. You drop your pikes, drawing swords to hack the heavy spears away. But the shafts are covered in iron and don't yield. The spears are heavy, and the butts drag the ground. The Harans can run almost as fast as their spears fly. As they reach you now, they jump on the shafts of the spears stuck in your shields, dragging them to the ground, leaving you on your knees and naked to their heavy axes. Arms still folded, she leaned toward them. I have seen men split from scalp to navel by those axes. Men glanced sideways at one another, their confidence shaken. She nodded mockingly as she unfolded her arms. I am not giving you conjecture. I've seen a Daharan force take down an experienced army nearly ten times their size in just this fashion. In the space of an hour, the battle turned from a rout of the Daharans to a rout of their foes. 
A Daharan charge of the Argon is almost as devastating as a classic cavalry charge, except they have far greater numbers than any cavalry. And their own cavalry is anything but typical. You don't even want to know about them. They lost half their number in the slaughter of Epinicia, and they are in camp now singing and drinking. Would you, if you lost every other one of you, be of good cheer? I know you believe you can win a battle against a force ten times your size, and I know also that such a thing can be done. But it is those experienced Daharan troops who on a battlefield fighting by the tactics of common war could bring about such a feat. Please believe me, I mean no disrespect to your bravery, but in the field of war you are not their equal, not yet. You could not defeat an army half their size were the battle fought the way your enemy would fight. That does not mean you cannot win. It means only that you must do it in another way. I believe you can win, and I'm going to tell you what you must do and lead you in the first strike to start you in this. The Imperial Order is not invincible. They can be defeated. From this day forward, I shall never again call you boys. From this day forward, you are men. You think of yourselves as soldiers of your homeland, Galia, but you are not. In this, you are not. You are soldiers, men of the Midlands, for it is not just Galia who will be conquered, but all of the Midlands if these men are not stopped. I call upon you to stop them. The tightly packed crowd of soldiers, tempered by what they had heard, shouted that they would do the job. She watched from under her eyebrows as they confidently pledged to fight to the end. There were angry whispers from some in the crowd to her right. Men were jostling each other and arguing. Some men wanted to speak and others were seeking to prevent it. If you should choose to join in this battle, you will follow orders without question, she said. But for this time only, you may speak your mind freely without retribution. If you have something to say, then let all hear it now, or else hold it to your grave. One man pulled his arm free of another. He glowered up at her. We're men. We don't follow women into battle. Kalin blinked at him. You follow Queen Cyrilla. She is our queen. We fight on her behalf. She doesn't lead us in battle. That's left to men to do. Kayla narrowed her eyes. What is your name? He glanced around at his fellows and then held his chin up. I'm William Mosel, and we've been trained by Prince Harold himself. And I, Kalin said, was trained by his father, King Wiborn. King Wiborn was my father, too. I am half-sister to Queen Cyrilla and Prince Harold. There were astonished murmurs throughout the crowd. Without taking her eyes from Mosul, she lifted a hand to silence them. But that does not count for command. You are soldiers. Your duty is to follow the orders of your commanders, and they the queen. And she must follow commands of the Central Council of the Midlands. The Council of the Midlands follows the orders of the Mother Confessor. For now, I fill that office. My family name is, like your queen's, Amnel. But I am of Confessor blood, first and last. I am the Mother Confessor of the Midlands, and as such, if I say you're to march into a lake, then it's your duty to march until you're breathing water and seeing fishes. Does that make it clear enough for you, soldier? A few other men were shoving at Mosul, urging him to go on with their grievances. It means you can order us. It doesn't mean you know what you're doing. Kalin let out a sigh and pulled some blood-stiffened hair back, hooking it behind an ear. I don't have the time today to tell you of all the training I've had, or of all the fighting against impossible odds I've been through, or the men I've had to kill in that fighting. I would tell you only that last night I went alone to the camp of the Imperial Order to save your life. The men of the Order, the Harans, fear the things of the night, spirits, and for protection from that and to assist them they had a wizard in their company. Had you in your confidence of battle knowledge tried to attack those men, that wizard would have known what you were doing and probably used magic to kill you all. Mosul's defiant expression didn't diminish, but some of the others broke into worried whispers. Fighting against steel was one thing, fighting against magic quite another. Captain Ryan stepped forward. The mother confessor killed the wizard, he said with pride. There were relieved sighs among the men. If it hadn't been for her experience, we would have marched to our deaths without even having the chance to lay steel to steel. I, for one, intend to follow those I've sworn my life to serve. My land, my queen, the Midlands, and the Mother Confessor. We're going to stop this threat against the Midlands, and we're going to do it by following those we are sworn to follow. We go into battle under the command of the Mother Confessor. I'm a soldier of the Galean army, Mosul seemed only to get more defiant. Not a soldier in any Midlands army. I fight for Galea. 
Not to protect lands like Kelton. Kalin watched as other men shouted their agreement. This army, the Imperial Order, or whatever they call themselves, is marching toward the border. Selyan is a border city, and most of it's on the other side of the river, in Kelton. Most of its citizens are Keltish. Why should we die for the Keltons? Men in the crowd were starting to argue with one another. Captain Ryan's face was red. Mosul, you're a disgrace to... Kalin held a hand out to silence him. No, Soldier Mosul is only speaking as he believes, as I asked him to. You men must understand me. I'm not ordering you to do this. I'm asking you to fight for the lives of innocent people of the Midlands. Tens of thousands of your fellow soldiers have already died in this battle. I would not ask you to lay down your lives for something you do not believe in. Most who go into this war will die. It's your decision to stay or not. You are not commanded to stay. But if you choose to stay, it will be under my command. I want no man with us who does not believe in what we do. Decide now if you will be with us or not. If not, then you are free to go, because you will be of no help to your comrades. Her voice turned as cold as the thin morning air. If you decide to go with me into this war, then you will follow the orders of your superiors. In the Midlands, there is no one to outrank me. You will follow my orders without question, or your punishment will be unsparing. Too much is at stake to have to suffer men who can't follow orders. If I say you will do something, then you will do it even if you know it's to cost you your life, because it's to save many more lives. I give no orders without sound reason, but I won't always have time to explain them. Your duty is to trust in your superiors and do as you're told. She held out a finger and swept it slowly over their heads. Choose then, with us or not, but choose this day for all time. Kaylin drew her hands back inside her warm fur mantle and waited in silence while men discussed and argued among themselves. Tempers flared and angry oaths were given. Men gathered around Mosul, and others moved away from him. I'm leaving then, Mosul called out to the others. He thrust his fist in the air. I'll follow no woman into battle, no matter who she is. Who's leaving with me? About sixty or seventy men gathered about, cheered their support for him. Go then, Kalin commanded, before you become caught up in a battle you do not believe in. Having made their choice, Mosul and the men with him cast their glares of contempt. He swaggered forward. We'll leave as soon as we can get our things together. We'll not be rushed out on your word. The men in the crowd pushed in. Before it came to blows, Kalin held her hand up. Stop! Let them be. They've made their choice. Let them get their things and be gone. Mosul turned and pushed his way back through the throng, his new men in tow. As they left the gathered soldiers, Kalin carefully counted their numbers. Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven who would leave. She looked out at all the faces. Any more? Do any more wish to leave? No one moved a muscle. Then do all of you wish to join in this fight? A united cheer went up. So be it. I wish I did not have to call upon you, Ben, to do this, but there is no one else to ask. My heart weeps for those of you who will die. Know that none of those who live will ever forget the sacrifice you make for them and the people of the Midlands. From the corner of her eye, she watched the sixty-seven men moving among the wagons, taking the supplies they thought they would need. And now, to what must be done? Slowly she shook her head. You men must understand what it is I call upon you to do. It is no glorious battle, as you think, where you move like pieces on a game board. No tactics to outwit an opponent in a grand engagement. We will not face them in the field of battle, but kill them in every other way. But Mother Confessor, someone near the front timidly called out, it's the code of honor for soldiers to face one another in battle. To best them in a fair fight. There is nothing fair about having to fight in war. The only fair thing would be to live in peace. The purpose of war is singular, to kill. You must all understand this, for it's central to your survival. There is no honor in killing, no matter the method. Dead is dead. Killing your enemy in war is done to protect the lives of those for whom you fight. Their lives are no better protected by killing your enemy sword to sword than by slaying him while he sleeps, but only put at risk by it. There is no glory in this task. It's an onerous deed. We do not intend to give them a chance to engage in pitched battle to see who is the better at the game. Our chore is simply to kill them. 
if you have difficulty seeing the right of this, then I call upon you to consider the honor of the soldiers you are up against. Consider them as they stood, waiting in gangs, to rape your mothers and sisters. Consider what your mothers and sisters in Ebenezer thought of honor as they were tortured and raped and slaughtered. The chill of her words sent visible shudders through the stone-silent men. Kaylin had to restrain herself from bringing any more horror to their eyes, but before her still floated the vision of the young women in the palace. If the enemy is looking the other way, so much the better, because they will not thrust a knife into you. If it is from a distance with an arrow, so much the better, because they will not have a chance to impale you on an argon. If it is while they have food in their mouths, so much the better, because they will not be able to raise an alarm. If it is while they are sleeping, so much the better, because they will not have a chance to cleave you with their sword. Last night my horse crushed the head of one of the Daharan commanders. There was no glory in that, no honor. Only the knowledge that perhaps that deed will prevent some of you from dying by his hand and wits. In that my heart sings with joy, joy that maybe it has saved some of your precious lives. What we do is done to save the lives of men and women yet alive and yet unborn. You saw what was done to the people in Ebenezer. Remember the faces of those dead. Remember the way they died and the horror they suffered before they did. Remember those soldiers captured and beheaded. It is up to us to prevent that from happening to any more people. To do that, we must kill these men. There is no glory in the doing, only survival. In the back, two men gestured obscenely to those around them and walked off to join with Mosul's men. Sixty-nine. But the rest stood in firm resolution to take up the fight. The time had come. She had dissuaded them from their raw thoughts of glorious battle and told them of the true nature of their task. She had brought most to an understanding of the larger temper of the battle ahead. She had told them some of what must be done. She had brought them to a more focused understanding of their importance in the scheme of this struggle. The time had come to charge them irreversibly to the burden, to forge them into an instrument of retribution that could annihilate the threat. Kaelin opened her arms to the men before her, her blood-soaked mantle hanging limp, I am dead, she called to the gray sky. Frowning, they all leaned in a little. What has happened to my countrymen, my countrywomen, my father's sons, mothers, and daughters has slain me. The agony of their slaughter has mortally wounded my heart. Her arms spread wider as her voice rose in wrath. Only vengeance can restore me. Only victory can return my life to me. She gazed into all the wide eyes, staring back. I am the mother confessor of the Midlands. I am your mothers, your sisters, your daughters yet unborn. I call upon you to die with me and live again only by avenging me. Kalin swept a hand out. Those of you who join with me in this are dead with me. Our lives can be returned only through vengeance. As long as one of our enemy lives, we are dead. We have no life to lose in this battle, for our lives are already lost here today, now. Only... When every one of the destroyers of Ebenezer is slain, may we live once again. Until then, we have no life. She looked out at the solemn faces of the men gathered before her, watching, waiting for her next words. On a warm breeze, the bloody wolf fur rustled against her cheek. Kaelin pulled free her knife and held it up in her fist for all to see. She laid the weapon over her heart. An oath, then, to the good people of Ebenezer, who are now with the spirits, and to the good people of the Midlands. Almost all the men followed her example, holding their knives over their hearts. Seven did not, but grumbling curses rose to join with Mosul. Seventy-six. Vengeance without mercy before our lives are returned to us, she pledged. The sober voice of every man before her repeated the oath, joining with every other in unflinching unity. Vengeance without mercy before our lives are returned to us. The roar of their words drifted away on the morning air. Kalin watched William Mosel cast a glance over his shoulder at her before following his men away, back up the pass. She returned her attention to those before her. You are all sworn an oath, then. Tonight we begin the killing of the men of the order. Let it be without quarter. We take no prisoners. No cheer went up this time. The men listened in grim attention. We must no longer travel as you have been with wagons to carry your needs and supplies. We must take only what we can carry. We need to be able to travel the woods, the small passes, so we can outmaneuver the men we hunt. 
I intend to sweep in at them from all directions and at will like wolves that hunt. And like wolves who hunt with coordination, we will control and direct them as wolves control and direct their prey. You are men of this land. You know the woods and mountains around us. You have hunted them since you were children. We will use your knowledge. The enemy is in strange territory and keeps to the wide passes with their wagons and great numbers. We will no longer be impeded as they. We will move through the country around them as do the wolves. You must divide up what you have in the wagons and place what you can carry in your packs. Leave the heavy armor. It takes too much effort to carry, and we are not going to fight that way. Take only light armor you can wear at a forced march. Take what food you can. You are to take no liquor or ale. When you have avenged the people of Epinicia, you may drink all you want. Until then, you will not. I want everyone alert at all times. We do not ever relax until our enemy is dead to a man. Some of the food that's left is to be packed into a few of the smaller wagons without any arms or armor. We will need volunteers to give it to the enemy. The men mumbled in surprise and confusion. The road divides ahead. When they are past the fork and on their way to Selian, the wagons with the food and all the ale are to take the other road and then the smaller routes to get ahead of them. You will lie in wait with these wagons until their advance guard nears and then cross their path so they can see you. When their forward column spots you and give chase, you are to abandon the wagons and escape. Let them have the food and drink. The Imperial Order is nearly out of ale, and tonight they will celebrate their luck. I expect they will get drunk. I want them to be drunk when we attack them. The men cheered with that news. Know this. We're as a wolf pack trying to bring down a bull. Though we are not strong enough to do it with one dispatching strike, we will harry him to exhaustion, drag him to the ground, and kill him. This will not be a single battle, but a constant nipping at his hide, taking small chunks of him at a time, wounding, weakening, and bleeding him all the while, until finally we have the advantage and can kill the beast. Tonight, under cover of darkness, we will slip into their camp and make a quick strike. This is to be a disciplined action, not random killing. We will have a list of objectives. Our aim is to weaken the bull. I have already partially blinded him by eliminating the wizard. The sentries and lookouts will be taken first. We will dress as many men as we can in their clothes. Those men will go into their camp and locate our targets. Our first need is to slow their ability to counterattack. I don't want us run down by cavalry. We need to bring ruin to their horses. There's no need to waste time killing them. Breaking their legs is sufficient. We need to destroy their food. We're an army small enough to be able to get food by hunting, foraging, and buying from surrounding farms and villages, but one that size requires much. If we destroy their food, they will be weakened. We need to kill their arrow makers and fletchers, bowyers and blacksmiths, all the craftsmen who can make and repair bows, arrows, and other weapons. They will have sacks of goose wings for fletching arrows. They must be stolen or burned. Every arrow not made is one that can't kill us. Bow staves need to be destroyed. Wreck their bugles if you find them, and the buglers. This will help take away their voice and coordination. Their lances, pikes, and argons will be stacked upright together. Five seconds and a few swings with an axe or sword will destroy a great many. Heavy axes or hammers will at least bend the argons and render them useless. Every lance or spear broken is one that can't kill you. We want to burn their tents to expose them to the cold, burn their wagons so they will lose supplies of every kind. Of most importance are their officers. I would rather kill one officer tonight than a thousand men. If we can kill their officers, it will make them dull and slow, and it will be easier to take this bull to the ground. If any of you can think of anything else that will weaken them, bring the ideas to me or Captain Ryan or the other officers. The object tonight is not primarily to kill soldiers. There are too many. Our object is to disable them, make them weak, slow, to make them less sure of themselves. Most of all, our object is to put fear into their minds. These men aren't used to being afraid. When men are afraid, they make mistakes. Those mistakes allow us to kill them. I intend to terrify them. Later, I will tell you how. You have a few hours to get everything ready, and then we start moving. I want the sentries at double distance. Beyond them, I want lookouts, and I want scouts to keep in contact with the order. I want to know where they are at all times. I want constant reports. I don't want to be surprised by anything. I want to know of anything that you see or encounter, no matter how innocent it seems. If a rabbit jumps too high, 
I want to know about it. Just as we intend to trick them, I don't want them tricking us. Take nothing for granted. May the good spirits be with you. Now get started. The men all began moving, the air coming to life with the sound of feet and talking. One of the two lieutenants stood near, unbuttoning his coat, giving orders to some men around him. Lieutenant Sloan. He looked up as the men he had instructed went to their tasks. See to the sentries and lookouts at once. I want any of your men who know how to make white paint or whitewash to assemble the supplies they need. We will need large tubs of some sort. I want rocks heated to warm the insides of tents. He didn't question her strange instructions. Yes, Mother Confessor. See that the small wagons with the ale and food are prepared, but hold them until I give the order to let them go. He put his fist to his heart without comment and marched off to see to it. Kaylin's legs felt as if they would give out at any second. She was so tired from having had no sleep and from riding the better part of the night to say nothing of the work she had done and the heart-pounding fright that she could hardly focus her eyes anymore. Her shoulder hurt where the lance had been couched when it was shattered. The muscles in her left leg jittered with the effort of keeping her standing. She was also mentally exhausted. Anxiety over not only the enormity of her decision to take it upon herself to call all the Midlands into war, but also over her impassioned plea for these men to lay down their lives on her word, eroded her strength further. Despite the unusual warmth of the day, she shivered inside her fur mantle. Captain Ryan stepped over to her. Chandelin, Prindon, and Tosidon were standing by the rear of the wagon watching. Captain Ryan gave her a sly smile. I like it. He jumped down and held his hand out for her. She ignored the hand and jumped down as he had done, and by luck more than anything, stayed on her feet. She could not accept his offer of help, not now, not with what she was about to do. And now, Captain, I must give you an order you are not going to like. She looked to his blue eye. I want you to send men after Mosul and those who went with him. Send enough to be sure to accomplish the deed. Deed? They must be killed. Send a force with instructions that they are to pretend to join with Mosul's men so they don't scatter when your men approach. Send your cavalry behind, but out of sight, in case they're able to take to the woods. When they are surrounded, kill them. There are seventy-six. Count the bodies to make sure they are all dead. I will be very displeased if even one escapes. His eyes were wide. But, Mother Confessor, I take no pleasure in this, Captain. You have your orders. She turned to the three mud people. Prindon, go with the men he picks. Make sure those who departed are killed to a man. Prindon gave her a grim nod. He understood the unpleasant necessity of what she was doing. Captain Ryan tensed in near panic. Mother Confessor, I know those men. They've been with us a long time. You said they were free to go. We can't... She laid a hand on his arm. He suddenly recognized the threat that represented. I am doing what I must to save your lives. You have given your word to follow orders. She leaned a little closer. Do not add yourself to those seventy-six. He at last gave a nod, and she removed her hand. His eyes told it all. Hate radiated from him. I didn't know the killing was to start with our own men, he whispered. It does not. It starts with the enemy. Captain Ryan pointed angrily up the pass. They're going in the opposite direction of the order. And did you think they would go to the enemy in plain sight of you? They intend to circle around. She turned and started off toward a tent that had been left up for her. Captain Ryan, trailed by Chondolin, Prindon, and Tosidon, followed her, unwilling to concede. If you were so concerned, why did you let them go? Why didn't you let the men kill them when they would have? Because I had to give all those who would renounce us and abandon their fellows the chance to do so. What makes you think all the traitors departed? There could be spies or assassins among us. Yes, there could be. But I have no evidence of that at the moment. If I find there are, I will have to deal with them then. Kalin came to a stop before the tent. If you think I may be making a mistake about those men, I assure you I am not. But even if I were, it is a price that must be paid. If we let them go and even one of them betrays us, we could all be killed in a trap tonight. If we die, there will be none to stop the order for a long time. How many thousands would die then, Captain? If those men are innocent, I'll have made a terrible mistake, and seventy-six innocent men will die. If I'm right, I will be saving the lives of untold thousands of innocent people. You have your orders. Carry them out. Captain Ryan shook with rage. I hope you don't expect me to ever forgive you for this. No, I don't. I expect only that you follow my orders. I don't care if you hate me, Captain. I care only that you live to do so. He 
he gritted his teeth in mute frustration. Kalin gripped the tent flap. Captain, I'm so tired I can hardly stand. I need to get a couple of hours sleep. I want a guard posted around this tent while I rest. He glared at her. And how can you be sure one of them might not be an enemy? They could kill you in your sleep. That's a possibility. But if that happens, one of these three men would avenge my murder. Captain Ryan flinched and glanced at the three mud people. In his anger, he had forgotten they were there. Chondolin lifted an eyebrow to him. I will first put sticks in his eyes to hold them open, to be sure he sees what I do. Lieutenant Hobson rushed up, holding a bowl out in his hands. Mother Confessor, I brought you some stew. I thought you would like something to eat, something hot. Kaylin forced herself to smile at him. Thank you, Lieutenant, but I'm so tired I'm afraid I wouldn't be able to keep it down. Could you keep it warm until after I've rested? Of course, Mother Confessor. Captain Ryan's glare slid to his grinning lieutenant. I have a job for you, Hobson. Two hours, Kalen said, and then wake me. You should all have enough to keep you busy in the meantime. She pulled the flap aside and went into the tent, nearly collapsing onto the cot. She drew a blanket over her legs and lifted the fur mantle over her head, shutting out the light. In her small private darkness, she shook. She would have given her life right then to have Richard hold her for just five minutes. Chapter 41 She was kissing Richard, holding him tightly in her arms, her mind filled with no thought but peace and joy when she started at the sound of shouting. Richard was gone. Her heavy arms were empty. She sat up, pushing the blanket away, frantic for an instant, not knowing where she was. And then she remembered... She felt as if she might vomit. She wished she could have a hot bath. She couldn't remember her last bath. She rubbed her eyes as Captain Ryan stuck his head inside the tent. How long? Kalen mumbled. How long have I slept? She threw the blanket aside. A couple of hours, just about. There is someone out here for you. Directly outside her tent waited a group of men, an ashen-faced Lieutenant Hobson among them. In their midst stood Mosul, bound and gagged and held at each arm by soldiers. His eyes darted about in panic. He tried to shout through the gag, but couldn't make himself understood. Kalim glowered over at Captain Ryan. He stood with one thumb hooked in his belt. I thought, Mother Confessor, that you would want to execute this man yourself, since he seems to have personally offended you so. He held his knife out toward her, handle first. Kalim ignored the knife and turned instead to the men holding Mosul. Release him and stand away. She felt as if she were still in a sleep, still in a dream, but she wasn't. There was no option. As they stepped back, she reached out and snatched Mosul by his arm. He froze in fright for an instant and then tried to back away, but he had no time to escape. She was touching him now. He was hers. Her sleepiness vanished in a sucking rush as her power ignited. She gave no thought to what she was about to do. There was no choice. She was committed. She gave herself over to it. The sounds of the camp, the jangle of tack, the grating of wooden boxes being skidded across wagon beds, the splintering of other boxes being pried open, the squeak of wheels, the whinnies of horses, the sounds of thousands of feet shuffling, men talking, the clop of hooves, the sound of steel being sharpened, the popping of wooden fires, and the sound of her own heart beating, all faded away to silence. In the silence of her mind, the power was all. She could feel Mosul's muscles tighten under her hand. But he had no chance. He was hers. In the silence, in the quiet, in the peace of her mind, as she had done countless times before, she released her power, her magic, into the man before her. There was a violent jolt to the air as it slammed into him, thunder without sound. The snow around her and Mosul billowed away in a ring, rising and tumbling until it dissipated and settled again. Mosul, no more who he had been, dropped to his knees in the wet snow before her. His brow wrinkled with panic that because of the gag he would not be able to ask her to command him. He sucked air through his nose trying to breathe with the terror that he might displease her. The camp around her had fallen into stunned silence, with her the heart of all attention. Kalin pulled the gag from his mouth. Tears of relief flooded from his eyes. Mistress, he whispered hoarsely. Please, mistress, command me. Tell me what I can do to serve you. In trepidation, hundreds of stunned faces around her watched. Kalin gazed down at the man on his knees before her. She wore her confessor's face. It would please me, William, 
if you would tell me the truth of what you plan to do after you left this camp. Page 428. He beamed with joy, more tears running down his cheeks, and would have clutched at her legs in gratitude had his arms not been bound behind his back. Oh, yes, mistress. Please let me tell you. Tell me then. It all came babbling out in a rush. I was going to the camp of those other men, the Imperial Order, you called them, and I was going to ask to join them. I was going to take all my men with me so they could join, too. I was going to tell them of the presence of the Galean recruits and of your plans so they would be pleased with us and would let us join with them. I thought they had a better chance than you, and I didn't want to die, so I was going to join with them. I thought they would be pleased if I brought the men to add to their ranks. I thought they would be pleased with us if we could help them crush you. He burst suddenly in sobs. Oh, please, mistress, I'm so sorry I thought to do you harm. I wanted them to kill you. Oh, please, mistress, I'm so sorry I intended you harm. Please, mistress, tell me how I can gain your forgiveness. I will do anything. Please command me, and it will be done. Please, mistress, what do you wish of me? I wish for you to die, she whispered in the icy silence. Right now. William Mosel crumpled forward against her boots and thrashed in racking convulsions. After a few long, agonizing seconds, he was still, his last breath rattling from his lungs. Kalen's gaze slid over a wide-eyed Captain Ryan to Prindon, standing behind a still ashen Lieutenant Hobson. Chandelin was glaring at him, too. She spoke in his tongue. Prindon, I told you to make sure they were all killed. Why did you not do as I said? He shrugged self-consciously. They were of a mind to do this. Captain Ryan told them to kill the others, but to bring this one to you. I did not know this when we left, or I would have told you. They had 200 men on foot, and another 100 on horses. As I told you, they were of a mind to do this, and I did not think I would be able to prevent it except by killing him myself, and then I realized they might kill me for doing it, and then I would not be able to be near you to protect you. Besides that, I knew you were right, and I thought it would do them good to learn a lesson. Did any escape? No. I was a little surprised at how well they did the job. They are good men. They did a hard thing, a thing they wept to do, but they did it well. None escaped them. Kalen let out a long breath. I understand, Prindon. You were right to do as you did. She cast a sideways glance at Chandelin. Chandelin will be satisfied, too. It was an order. Prindon gave her a tight smile of relief. Her glare slid to Captain Ryan. Satisfied? He stood stiff, pale, and wide-eyed. Yes, Mother Confessor. She swept a glance over the gathered men. Is everyone satisfied now? There came from them all an uncoordinated mumbled chorus of Yes, Mother Confessor. If there had been some before who were not terrified of her, there were none now who were not. The lot of them looked as if, were a twig to snap unexpectedly, they would bolt for the hills like frightened rabbits. This was probably the first time most had seen magic, and it wasn't wonderful, beautiful magic, but daunting, ugly magic. Mother Confessor, Captain Ryan whispered. His arm was still held out, frozen, the knife he had offered her still in his hand. What are you going to do to me for disobeying your orders? She looked to his bloodless face. Nothing. This is your first day of being men in the war against the Order. Most of you didn't believe in the importance of what I had commanded. You had not fought in war before and did not understand the need. I will be satisfied that you have learned something from this and leave it at that. Captain Ryan swallowed. Thank you, Mother Confessor. With a shaking hand, he slid his knife back in its sheath. I grew up with him. He lifted the hand toward the body at her feet. We lived about a mile apart on the same road. We used to go hunting and fishing together all the time. We helped each other with chores. We always went to feast day in our best coats of the same color. We always... I'm sorry, Bradley. There is nothing to ease the pain of betrayal or loss except time. As I told you, war is not fair. Were it not for the men of the Order making war, perhaps you would be fishing today with your friend. Blame the Order and avenge him, too, with all the rest. He nodded. Mother Confessor, what would you have done if you were wrong? What would you have done if Mosul wasn't going to the enemy? She regarded him until his gaze rose to meet hers. I probably would have taken that knife you offered and killed you. 
She turned from his hollow expression and put a hand on the shoulder of the man next to him. Lieutenant Hobson, I know you had a difficult task. Prindon tells me you did it well. He looked near tears, but still managed to stiffen his back with pride. She noticed that his beard hadn't even started to grow in earnest yet. Thank you, Mother Confessor. She looked around at the hundreds of men standing about watching. I believe you all have work. As if they had just awakened, everyone began moving again, slowly at first and then with accelerating urgency. Hobson gave a salute of his fist to his heart and turned to other business. The men who had brought Mosul lifted his body and carried it off. Others went to Chandelin and the two brothers, asking for instructions. Captain Ryan stood alone with her, watching as everyone went about their work. Her legs felt limp and slack like bowstrings left out in the rain all night. For a confessor to use her power when she was rested and alert was taxing. To use it when she was already tired was perilously exhausting. She could hardly keep herself upright. She had been dead tired from riding all night to the enemy camp and back, to say nothing of the fight with them. She needed more sleep than she had gotten, and using her power had cost her even the benefit of the short nap, and then some. She had used what strength she had left to do something that should have been done without her. She thought maybe it must be the cold, and traveling in such difficult conditions, but she seemed more tired than usual lately. Maybe she could ask Prindon to make her some more tea. Could I speak with you for a moment, Mother Confessor? Captain Ryan asked. Kalen nodded. What is it, Captain? He pushed his unbuttoned wool coat open, shoving his hands in his back pockets. He glanced away to watch some men filling water skins. I just want to say that I'm sorry. I was wrong. It's all right, Bradley. He was your friend. It's difficult to believe ill of a friend, I understand. No, that's not it. My father always told me that a man had to admit his mistakes before he could do right in this world. He shuffled his feet and looked around, finally bringing his blue eyes to her. The mistake I made was believing that you wanted Mosul killed because he wouldn't follow you. I thought you were being spiteful because he didn't want to follow you. I made a mistake, and I'm sorry. Sorry I thought that of you. You were trying to protect us, even though you knew we would hate you for it. Well, I don't hate you. I hope you don't hate me. I'm honored to follow you into this battle. I hope that someday I'm half as wise as you and have the guts you do to use that wisdom. She released a quiet sigh. I'm hardly older than you, yet you make me feel like an old woman. I'm relieved, you understand. It's a small pleasure in all this pain. You're a fine officer and will do right by this world. He smiled. I'm glad we're on good terms again. A man approached and was waved forward by the captain. What is it, Sergeant Frost? Sergeant Frost gave a salute of his fist to his heart. We sent a few men out and in an abandoned barn, they found some crushed chalk and other things needed to make whitewash. We have some wooden tubs we can mix it in. You said you wanted it in something big. They're big enough to bathe in. How many of these tubs do you have, Kalen asked. A dozen, Mother Confessor. Put the tubs near each other and pitch a tent around each. Use the largest tents you have, even if it is the command tents. Make the whitewash with hot water and place the heated stones inside the tents to keep it as warm as possible inside. Let me know when all this is seen to. Keeping his obvious questions to himself, the sergeant saluted and rushed off to see it done. Captain Ryan gave her a curious frown. What do you want with whitewash? We've just got him back on good terms. Let's not spoil it for a bit. I'll tell you after things are prepared. Are the wagons ready? Should be. Then I must see to them. Did you send the sentries and lookouts? First thing. As she walked through the camp to the wagons, men came to her constantly. The wagon wheels, Mother Confessor. As we destroy things, we should stave in the wheels. And their battle standards. Shouldn't we burn them so they can't rally their men around them? And couldn't we set fire to their baggage so if the weather turns colder, they'll freeze? And if we were to throw manure in their barrels of drinking water, they would have to waste time melting snow and a hundred other ideas from the absurd to the worthwhile. She listened to each with attention, giving her honest opinion, and in a few cases, her orders to see it done. Lieutenant Hobson came at a trot, holding out a tin bowl. That was the last thing she needed. Mother Confessor, I kept some stew hot for you. Beaming, he handed her the bowl as she walked. She tried to act grateful. He walked along next to her, watching, grinning. She forced herself to take a spoonful and to tell him how wonderful it tasted. It was all she could do to keep that one spoonful down. After using her power, a confessor needed time to recover. For some, it was days. 
For her, it took a couple of hours. Rest, if she could get it, was the best thing for a confessor after using her power. The little rest she had gotten was now wasted. She could get no more now, and probably would get none this night either. The last thing a confessor needed while recovering her power was food. It diverted her energy to the food instead of returning her strength. She had to think of a way out of eating the bowl of stew, or it would end up on the ground to the embarrassment of all. Thankfully, she reached the wagons before she had to take another mouthful. She asked Lieutenant Hobson to get Chandelin and the two brothers and bring them to her. After he left, she set the bowl down on the splinter bar of the dray with the casks of ale and climbed up. She motioned Captain Ryan up on the wagon as she counted. Get some men. Unload the top rows so we can get at them all. Write the casks on the bottom row and withdraw the plugs. As he motioned for men to help with the task, she asked, Did Chandelin have you all make a troga? A troga was a simple, stout piece of cord or a wire with a wooden handle on each end and long enough so that when it was given a twist, it made a loop that was the right size to drop over a man's head. It was applied from behind, and then the handles yanked apart. If it was made of wire, placed correctly at the neck joints, and the man wielding it had arms big enough, his troga could decapitate a person before the victim had a chance to make a sound. Even if it wasn't wire, or his arms were not that strong, the victim still made no sound before he died. Captain Ryan reached behind his back under his coat, and retrieved a wire troga, holding it up for her to see. He gave us a little demonstration. He was gentle, but I'm still glad I wasn't the one he demonstrated on. He says he and Prendon and Tocidon will use these to take the sentries and lookouts. I don't think he believes we can sneak up on them like he can. But many of us have spent a lot of time hunting, and we're more clever. Captain Ryan leapt with a yelp. Chondolin had poked him in the ribs, having come up unseen behind him. The captain comforted his ribs and scowled at a smiling Chandelin. Prindon and his brother climbed up to help unload the barrels. You wish something, Mother Confessor? Chandelin asked. Kaylin held her hand out. Give me your bandu, your ten-step poison. His brow wrinkled into a scowl, but he reached into the pouch at his waist and pulled out the bone box, leaning over to hand it to her. The brothers fished out their boxes, too, and handed them to her. How much will I be able to poison with it? How many casks can I make poison? Jondolin stepped around Captain Ryan, balancing atop the sides of the round barrels. You are going to put it in this drink? Kalen nodded. But then we won't have any more. We must have it with us. We may need it. I'll leave a bit for emergencies. Everyone we can kill in this way is one less to fight. But they might discover it's poison, Captain Ryan said. Then we won't even have them drunk. They have dogs, Kalen said. That's why I want to send them food, too. They will throw the dogs some of the meat to make sure it's good. I'm hoping they will be put at ease after testing the food on the dogs and anxious enough for the ale that the idea of it being poisoned won't come into their heads. Chondolin counted the barrels silently and then straightened. There are 36. Twelve for each of our bandu. He scratched his head of black hair while he pondered. It will not kill them unless they drink much but it will make them sick. How sick? What will it do? It will make them weak. They will be sick in their stomachs. Their heads will spin inside. Maybe some will die in a hand of days from the poison sickness. Kalen nodded. It will be a great help. But this is hardly enough for all their men, Captain Ryan said. Only some will drink this. Some will go to the unit who plundered it, and the rest will be divided among the men of rank first with what's left going to the soldiers. The men of rank are the ones I'm after. All the top rows were unloaded, leaving only the bottom row, which the men stood up so the plugs could be removed. Why are six of these barrels smaller? They are rum, the captain said. Rum? The drink of nobility? Kalen smiled. The commanders will take the rum first. She straightened from peering into one of the open casks. Chandelin, will they be able to taste it? Will the taste give them warning if I put more in some? He dipped a finger in a cask of rum and sucked it clean. No, this is bitter enough. Bitter things hide the taste of bandu. Kaylin used her knife point to divide the poison from Chandelin's box into sixths. She swished each sixth off her knife point into the round opening in one of the smaller casks, those with the rum. Chandelin watched what she was doing. That much in the smaller barrels will probably kill them by morning, 
The next day for sure. But now you have none for the other six. Kalin handed Chondolin back his bone box with a little of the bandu left in the corners and climbed down from the dray. Six of the casks of ale will have no poison, so that we can be sure the rum will kill those who drink it. She put a knife point laden with poison from Tosidon's box into each of the next twelve. Mix all the barrels up. I don't want the rum on the bottom. The commanders might not see it and take the ale instead. Kalin went to the last twelve and opened Prindon's box. She looked up. You don't have very much. What have you done with yours? Prindon looked as though he wished she hadn't asked that question. He gestured vaguely. When we left, I was not thinking so good. You were in a hurry, and so I forgot to see that my bandu box was full. Chondolin put his fists on his hips and glared down from atop the wagon. Prendon, how many times have I said that you would forget to take your feet could you walk away without them? It doesn't matter, Kalin said. Prendon looked relieved to have her interrupt Chondolin's questioning. This will make them sick. That is all that matters. As she was putting it in the barrels, she heard men in the distance hailing her. When she had swirled the poison into the last barrel, she looked up to see two huge draft horses trotting toward her. She frowned at seeing men riding them bareback and calling out to her. The two powerful draft horses looked shaggy in their thick, dun-colored winter coats with heavy white feathering on their legs. They wore their harnesses and neck collars, but not their breeching. Several bends of chain were looped over the inside hame of each collar. The men about all stared at the odd sight. When the horses came to a halt before her, the riders unhooked the loops of chain and dropped them to the ground. She realized then that the horses were connected by that chain, attached to the haim hooks on their collars. She had never seen such a thing. The two riders slid to the ground. Mother Confessor! Their grins made their salutes look a little silly. The both of them were gangly, with short-cropped brown hair. Neither looked as if he could be fifteen. Their wool coats were unbuttoned in the warming day and fit them like gunny sacks on lap dogs. They both looked about to burst with excitement. They halted before getting too close, but even their fear of her couldn't wither their breathless excitement. What are your names? I'm Bryn Jackson, and this is Peter Chapman, Mother Confessor. We had an idea, and we wanted to show you. We think it'll do the job. We're sure it will. It'll work some clever, it sure will. Kalen looked from one beaming face to the other. What will do what job? Bryn almost leapt with joy at being asked. He hefted the chain lying in the snow between the big horses. This! He lugged a wad of chain to her and held it out. This will do it, Mother Confessor. We thought of it ourselves, Peter and me. He dumped the heavy chain on the ground. Show her, Peter. Move them apart. Peter's head bobbed as he grinned. He sidestepped his horse until the heavy chain lifted off the snow. The sag of chain swung to and fro between the haim hooks on the collars. Kaelin and all the men with her frowned, trying to understand what the peculiar rig was for. Bryn pointed at the chain. You said we were going to leave the wagons, and we surely didn't want to leave Daisy and Pip behind. Them's our horses, Daisy and Pip. We're drivers. We wanted to help and make a good use of Daisy and Pip, so we took some of the biggest trace chains and asked Morvan, he's the blacksmith, we asked Morvan to weld a couple of them together for us. He nodded expectantly, as if that should explain it. Kalin dipped her head toward him a little. And now that he has? Bryn held his hands open in excitement. You said we needed to take out their horses. He couldn't help giggling. That's what this is for. You said we're going to attack at night. Their horses will be tethered to picket lines. We gallop Daisy and Pip down the picket line, one on each side, and the chain will break their legs out from under them. We'll take out the whole line in one sweep. Kaylin leaned back and folded her arms. She looked to Peter. He nodded, keen on the idea, too. Bryn, having horses chained together like that at a gallop and dragging a chain that will be catching things, heavy things, sounds to me very dangerous. He wilted only a little. But it could take out their horses. We can do it. We can get them for you. They have close to 2,000 horses. Peter wilted more. Bryn scrunched up his face as he looked at the ground for the first time. He scratched his shoulder. Two thousand, he finally whispered in disappointment. Kalin glanced to Captain Ryan. He shrugged as if to say he didn't know if it would work or not. The other men standing about rubbed their chins and shuffled their feet as they pondered the rig. It will never do, Kalin said at last. Bryn's shoulders slumped more. There are too many of them for you. 
You will need more horses set up like this. Bryn and Peter's faces came up, their eyes widening. Since you two know how to do it, I want you to get all the draft horses and their drivers together. This will be the best use of their skill. Use all the equipment off the wagons or breaching you need. We'll not be taking them anyway. Have the chains made up at once. And then I want you all to practice the rest of the day. I want you to set up things to drag the chains through, heavy things, so the horses will get used to what you're going to do. You need to practice so each team of men and horses can work together. Peter came forward and stood next to a beaming Bryn. We will, Mother Confessor. You'll see, we can do it. You can count on us. She gave them each a sobering look. What you want to do is dangerous, but if you can do it, it will be a great benefit to us. It could save many of our lives. Their cavalry is deadly. Take your gear and your practice seriously. Men will be trying to kill you when you do it for real. They put their fists to their hearts, this time holding their chins up. We'll see to it, Mother Confessor. You can count on the drivers. We won't let you down. We'll get their horses. After receiving her nod, they turned to their horses. Heads together whispering in excitement, they went to their task. Kalin watched a lone rider in the distance, galloping through the camp. He stopped to ask a group of men something. They pointed in her direction. They've only been with us a couple months, Captain Ryan said. They're just boys. Kalin raised an eyebrow to him. They are men fighting for the Midlands. When I first saw you, I thought of you in much the same way you see them. Now I think you look a little older to me. He sighed. I guess you're right. If they really can do the job, it will be a brilliant achievement. The galloping rider approached and leapt from his horse before it came fully to a stop. He gave a perfunctory salute. Mother Confessor, he gulped some air. I'm Senric, with the sentries. What is it, Senric? You said you wanted to know about everything, so I thought I'd better report. We were just setting up the sentries, about an hour out, between here and the Army of the Order, near a road that crosses Jara Pass, and a coach came up the crossroad from the direction of Kelton. We knew you didn't want anything unusual going on, so we stopped the coach. I thought I'd better find out what you wanted us to do. Who's in the coach? An old couple. Wealthy merchants of some sort, or so they claim. Something about orchards. What did you tell them? You didn't tell them about us, did you? You didn't tell them that we have an army out here, did you? He shook his head vehemently. No, Mother Confessor. We told them that there were outlaws in the neighborhood and that we were a small patrol out looking for them. We told them they weren't allowed to pass until I checked with my commander. I said they had to wait until I returned. Kalin nodded. That's quick thinking, Senric. The driver's name is Ahern. He wanted to argue with us and thought to give his team reins until we showed him some steel. Then the old man came flying out of the coach, accusing us of trying to rob him. He started to swing his cane around at us, like he thought that would drive us off or something. Anyway, we drew arrows on him, and he decided he would get back in the coach. What is his name? Sinric shifted his weight to the other foot and scratched his eyebrow. Robin or Reuben or something like that. Feisty old fellow. Reuben, I think. Reuben Ribnick. I think that's it. Kaylin sighed as she shook her head. They don't sound like spies. But if the order catches them and they know anything, they will tell it all before the Daharans are through with them. She looked up. What are they doing out here? The old man says his wife is sick and they're taking her to healers in Nicobaris. She didn't look well to me. Her eyes looked to be all rolled back in her head. Well, since they're on the road going northwest, going across Jara Pass, that shouldn't take them anywhere near the order. She pulled some of her long hair back off her face. But before I dare let them go, I best go speak with them. Before she could take three steps, Sergeant Frost came running up behind. Mother Confessor, the tubs of whitewash are ready. The tents are heated. Kalen let out a noisy breath. She looked from Sergeant Frost to Sentry Sinric. The other men waited patiently to talk with her or ask instructions. She let out another breath. Look, Sinric, I don't have the hour to ride out there and another to ride back. I'm sorry, but I just don't have the time. He nodded. Yes, Mother Confessor, I understand. What do you wish done? She steeled herself to the orders. Kill them. Mother Confessor? Kill them. We can't be sure of the truth of who they are, and this is too important to worry about strangers running around loose. We can't take the risk. Make it quick so they don't suffer. She turned away toward Sergeant Frost. But Mother Confessor... She looked over her shoulder. Sinric gathered up a length of reins. The driver, Ahern, he has a royal pass. Kalin turned back and frowned. A what? A royal pass medallion. 
It's a medallion that was given to him by Queen Cirilla herself. It says he was a hero to the people of Ebenezia in the siege, and in honor of his service, he is to be given unhindered pass anywhere in Galia. The queen herself gave this pass? Senric nodded. I'll do what you command, Mother Confessor. But with this medallion, the queen has promised him her protection. Kaelin rubbed her forehead with her fingertips. She was so tired she could hardly focus her mind to think. Since he has a pass given by the queen, we must honor it. She pointed a finger to the sentry. But you tell him that he must be clear of the area immediately. Repeat what you told him about there being outlaws in the neighborhood. Tell him that you're hunting these outlaws, and that if you catch Ahern and his coach around here again, you're ordered to assume they are in with the outlaws and you're to execute them on the spot. The road to Nicobaris goes northeast. Tell them to keep to it and not to stop before they're a good long distance from here. Senric clapped a fist to his heart as she turned to take Captain Ryan's arm and lead him toward the tents with the whitewash. Behind, she heard the sentry gallop off toward the coach he had found. The other men took the hint that they weren't to come and went about other business. She loosened the thong holding her mantle closed. The temperature had climbed above freezing, and the clouds had lowered nearly to the ground. The air felt ringing wet. Fog will move in by this afternoon, he observed. This whole valley pass will be thick with it tonight. He glanced to her questioning frown. I lived in these mountains my whole life. When it takes a thaw like this in winter, the fog settles into the passes for at least a couple of days. Kalen surveyed the mountainsides ascending into the gray clouds. That will serve us well, especially for what I have in mind. It will be an aid to us in bringing terror to the enemy. So are you ready to tell me what we're to paint? Kalen let out a tired sigh. We've devised a number of plans to strike targets that must be destroyed. Tonight will be our best chance of accomplishing those things because they will be surprised. We will not have a chance of surprise like this again. After tonight, they will be expecting our next attacks. I understand. The men, too, know the importance of this. They will do well. We must also not lose sight of our intent. Our intent is to kill these men. Tonight we will have the chance to do that as perhaps at no other time. We must take that opportunity. How many swordsmen do we have? He was silent a moment as he tallied the numbers in his head. Nearly 2,000 are swordsmen. Not quite another 800 archers, and the rest divided up among pikemen, lancers, and cavalry, among others, including the rest of what an army needs from drivers to fletchers to blacksmiths. Kaylin nodded to herself. I want you to select about a thousand swordsmen. Pick the strongest, the fiercest, the most eager for the fight. And what are we going to do with these men? The men dressed in the uniforms of the sentries we kill will make an exploration of the enemy camp and come back and give us the locations of our objectives. We have enough men to do the tasks we have assigned for those objectives. The swordsmen are for beginning our prime objective, killing the enemy. They will first see to the enemy commanders just in case they weren't poisoned, and then after that they will kill as many men as they can in the shortest possible time. They came to the dozen tents, set up close together in a half circle. Kaylin checked inside them all to be sure they were equipped as she had ordered. Finished checking, she stood outside the largest and faced Captain Ryan. So, are you going to tell me now what it is where to paint? Kaylin nodded. Those thousand swordsmen. He stared, dumbfounded. We're going to paint the men? Why? It's simple. The Harans fear spirits. They fear the spirits of the foes they kill. That's why they drag the bodies of their fallen comrades away from a battle site, like Abenicia. Tonight, their fears are going to come to haunt them. They are going to be attacked by the thing they fear most, spirits. But they will recognize us as soldiers, simply with white clothes, not as spirits. Kaylin looked at Captain Ryan from under her eyebrows. They will not be wearing clothes. They will have nothing but their swords, painted white, just as are they. They will remove their clothes just before the attack. His mouth dropped open. What? I want you to get the swordsmen together now and assemble them here. They're to go into the tents, remove their clothes, and dip themselves in the whitewash. After dunking themselves, they will stand near the hot rocks until dry. It won't take long. Then they can put their clothes back on until the attack. Captain Ryan stood in shock. But it's winter. They'll freeze without clothes. We have a break in the bitter cold. Besides, the cold will remind them to rush in and rush back out. I don't want them to stay in that camp very long. 
The enemy will recover from their shock in short order and set upon any invader. I want our men to attack, kill terrified Daharans, and escape. As I said, Daharans fear spirits. When they see what they will at first think is their worst fear, they will be stunned. Their first thought will be to run, not to fight. Men die as easily from a sword through the back as through the front. Some will freeze in place, not knowing what to do. Even those who recognize the invaders as men painted white and not as spirits will be confused for a moment. Those few seconds of confusion as we come upon each new group are the seconds we need to run them through. In battle, the difference between killing and being killed is often a single moment of indecision. The swordsmen are not to engage in fights. If challenged, they're to run on to others. There are more than enough to kill. It's a mistake to waste time engaging in battle if it can be avoided. I simply want enemy soldiers killed. After the commanders are dead, it doesn't matter which ones. I don't want our men fighting unless forced to. That only risks their lives needlessly. Rush in, kill as many men as possible, and rush out. Those are to be the orders. Captain Ryan frowned as he considered. I never thought I would hear myself say it, but I think it sounds like it might be an outlandishly successful tactic. The men aren't going to like it at first, but they'll follow orders. I'll explain it to them, and then I know they'll feel a little better about it. I've never heard of such a thing, and I'm sure the enemy hasn't either. He at last smiled a sly smile. It's sure to surprise them, no doubt about that. Kalin was relieved he had come around to that much of it. Good. I'm pleased to have the enthusiasm of a captain in the Galean army, in the Midlands army. Now, I want you to have my horse's saddle and tack brought here and dipped in the whitewash. And please post some guards outside this tent while I'm inside. His eyes widened. Your saddle? You're not. Mother Confessor, you can't be serious. I would not ask my men to do something I myself would not do. They need to have a commander to rally around in their first battle. I intend to lead them. Captain Ryan took a step back. He was aghast. He regained the step. But Mother Confessor, you're a woman. And not in any way an ugly woman. Seemingly involuntarily, he took a quick glance the length of her. In fact, you are... Mother Confessor, forgive me. He fell silent. They are soldiers with a mission. Make your point, Captain. His face filled with blood. These are young men, Mother Confessor. They are... Well, you can't expect... They are young men. His jaw moved as he tried to find words. They won't be able to help themselves. Mother Confessor, please, you'll be embarrassed beyond all tolerance. He winced, hoping he wouldn't have to explain further. She gave him a small smile to try to ease his horror. Captain, have you ever heard the legend of the Shahari? He shook his head. When the tribes and lands now called Dahara were being forged together, the method of conquest and joining were much the same as it is with the imperial order. Join with them or be conquered. The Shahari people refused to join into Dahara, and they refused to be conquered. They fought so fiercely that they came to be greatly feared by the Daharan troops who outnumbered them many times over. The Shahari loved nothing more than fighting. They were so fearless and aroused about going into war that they went into battle naked and, well, aroused. Kalin looked up to see Captain Ryan staring, mouth agape. She went on. The Daharans all know the legend of the Shahari. They all to this day fear the Shahari. She cleared her throat. If the men go into battle and that happens, it will only bring greater fear to the men of the order. I don't think, though, that the men need fear being embarrassed. They will have more pressing matters on their minds, like not being killed. And if it does happen, well, then they should know it pleases me, because it will only strike greater fear into the hearts of our enemy. Captain Ryan finally looked to the ground and pushed snow with his boot. Forgive me, Mother Confessor, but I still don't like it. It puts you at danger for nothing of much gain. That's not true. There are two more important reasons I must do this. First, when I left the Order's camp last night, I was being chased by about 50 men. The Daharans have no doubt that those 50 men will catch me and kill me. The captain stiffened. You mean there are 50 men roaming around looking for you? No, they're all dead, to a man. But the men back at camp don't know that. When they see me all white like a spirit, they will think I was killed, as I should have been, and that it's my spirit in their midst. It will only frighten them further. 
Oh, 50? He peered up at her. And what's the second reason? Kaylin stared at him for a moment. Her voice came softly. When those men of the order see me, whether they think me a spirit or they think me a naked woman on a horse before them, they will stare. While they are staring, they cannot kill our men, but we can kill them. It will divert their attention from the men to me. He gazed silently at her as she went on. I would suffer any embarrassment on my part, she said, if it will save the life of even one of our men. I must do this to help them and to keep them alive. He looked to the ground as he put his hands in his pockets. I never knew the mother confessor was a person who cared this much for people, he whispered. I never knew before that she cared at all what happened to any of us. He looked up at last. Is there anything at all I can say to talk you out of doing this? Kaylin smiled. There is only one man in the world who could keep me from doing this, and you are not he. She laughed quietly. In fact, if he knew what I was about to do, I'm sure he would forbid it. His curiosity overcame his caution. One man? Is he your mate? She shook her head. He is the one you will choose as your mate? Kaylin sighed pleasantly. No, he is the one I'm to wed. At least I hope to wed him. He asked me to marry him. She smiled at the confused look on his face. His name is Richard. He is the Seeker. Captain Ryan stiffened and his breath cut off. If I'm asking what I shouldn't, just say so, but I thought all confessors used their power. I thought your magic would... I didn't think confessors could marry. They can't, but Richard is special. He has the gift, and my power cannot harm him. Captain Ryan smiled at last. I'm glad. I'm happy for you, Mother Confessor. Kalin lifted an eyebrow. But if you ever meet him, don't you dare tell him about this, pretending to be a spirit business. He has rather fusty views about such things. If you told him you let me run around naked with a thousand of your men, he would probably take your head off. Kalin laughed at the alarmed look on the captain's face. Captain, I need a sword. A sword? Now you're going to fight, too? Kalin leaned toward him. Captain, if I'm sitting there naked and a Daharan wishes to despoil my honor, how am I to defend myself unless I have a sword? Oh, well, I see your point. He thought a moment. An idea brightened his face, and he withdrew his own sword from its scabbard. He held the weapon out in both hands. It was an old sword with a blade pattern wielded in the old fashion and acid etched in the fuller to display the wavy folds of steel. This blade was given to me by Prince Harold when I became an officer. He said it was his father's, that it was one that belonged to King Wiborn himself. He said King Wiborn held it once in battle. He shrugged self-consciously. Of course, a king has many swords and holds many of them in battle at least once, so they will be said to have been wielded by a king in defense of his kingdom, so it's not really valuable or anything. He looked up expectantly. But I would be honored if you took it as yours. It seems only right that, well, since you're King Wiborn's daughter, I guess that you should wield his sword in battle. Maybe it has magic or something and will help protect your life. Kalin carefully lifted the sword from his hands. Thank you, Bradley. This means a lot to me. You are wrong. It is valuable. I will carry it with honor, but I will not keep it. When I'm finished and leave for Aedendril in a couple of days, then I will return it, and you will have a sword wielded not only by a king, but by the Mother Confessor, too. He grinned with the idea of that. Now, would you please post a guard outside this tent, and then see to the swordsman? He smiled a little smile and brought his fist to his heart. Of course, Mother Confessor. As Kalin went inside the warm tent, he was already returning with three men. He had a scowl on his face as serious as any scowl she had ever seen on any officer's face. And while the Mother Confessor is in her bath, you will keep your back to the tent and not let anyone near. Is that clear? Yes, Captain the three wide-eyed soldiers said together. Inside, in the warmth, Kaylin leaned the sword against the tub, slipped off the fur mantle, and then her clothes. She was so tired she felt sick. Her stomach felt as if it were rising and falling in waves. Her head spun so that she had to fight nausea that swelled in bouts. She dragged her hand through the whitewash. It was hot like a wonderful bath, but this was no bath. She lifted her legs over the edge one at a time and eased herself down into the silky, smooth white water. Her breasts felt buoyant in the milky pool. For a few minutes, she draped her arms over the sides of the tub, closed her eyes, and pretended it was a hot bath. She wished so much that it could be a bath, but it wasn't. 
It was something she did to keep some men alive and to kill others. She would wear white as the mother confessor always did, but it would not be her dress as always before. Kaylin lifted her father's sword and held the hilt between her breasts with the length of the blade running down her body against her belly and between her legs. She crossed her ankles and kept her legs apart so as not to slice her thighs on the weapon. She held her nose closed with her other hand, squeezed her eyes shut tight, took a deep breath, and then submerged herself. Chapter 42 Richard and Sister Verna continued on through a dark and humid, dank and stifling tunnel of green, ascending the gently sloping road toward the humming, haunting sound of distant flutes. Branches holding not only their own leaves, but vines of every sort, spiraling around and over them, and pale moss hanging in wispy curtains, filled the gaps between trunks to the sides and nearly closed off the light from above. Short walls to each side, looking to have been built in an attempt to hold back the tangled growth, were instead being snared by it and slowly enfolded into the creeping, leafy mat of life they sought to retain. From joints in the stone block, vines sprouted, surrounding and smothering whole sections of wall, bulging it in other places, pushing the occasional stone out to hang at a drunken angle, unable to fall to the ground because of the net of tendrils. The walls looked as if they were prey, being swallowed by a ponderous predator. Only one part of the walls was untouched by the forest life, the human skulls. Atop the walls to each side, they were spaced at intervals of no more than three feet, each sitting on its own square of lichen-splotched stone, each clean of growth, looking like so many finules with eye sockets and toothy grins. Richard had lost count of the number of skulls. His curiosity, his dread, failed to overcome his stubborn silence. He and the sister had not spoken since their last argument. He had not even slept in camp with her, preferring instead to spend his watch and the rest of the night hunting and sleeping with Gratch. Sister Verna's angry silence was at last no match for his. He had no intention this time of being the one to make amends. They both contented themselves with looking at anything but each other. Opening into sunlight, the road widened, splitting in the distance around a striated pyramid. Richard frowned, trying to see what made it look the way it did, a dotted pale tan with darker bands at evenly spaced intervals up its sides. He judged its height at three times his eye level from where he sat atop Bonnie. As they approached, he realized the mound was constructed entirely of bones, human bones. The dotted tan parts were skulls, and the bands were leg and arm bones, placed end out in layers. He guessed there must be tens of thousands of skulls in the orderly heap. He stared as they rode past. Sister Verna didn't seem to take notice. Beyond the bone pile, the wide road led into a plaza of a dark and hazy city in the middle of the thick forest. The flat hilltop had been cleared of every tree, as had the terraced fields they had passed not an hour before. The fields looked to be in preparation for planting. The ground was freshly turned, and there were stick people to scare away the birds when the seed was planted. It was winter, yet here in this place, people planted. Richard thought it a wonder. Rather than feeling open, this vast city, cleared of every bit of green that surrounded it, seemed even more closed and dark than the tunneled road. Buildings were square, with flat roofs, and faced with dingy plaster the color of bark. Near the roofs and at each floor level, the ends of support logs stuck from the plastered walls. Windows were small, with never more than one in a wall. The buildings varied in height, but most were attached into irregular blocks. The tallest must have had four floors. None had the slightest variation in style other than their height. Haze and wood smoke obscured the sky and the buildings in the distance. The plaza seemed simply an open place around a well in the center and was the only open area of any size. It quickly terminated in narrow, dark streets with smooth walls rising up to each side, creating man-made chasms. Overhead, many of the blocky buildings bridged the streets, making them dark tunnels. And where there were none of the bridging buildings overhead, Wash hung on lines between opposing windows. Some streets were cobblestone, but most were mud, running with fetid water. People in drab, loose-fitting clothes filled the narrow streets, walked barefoot through the mud, stood with their arms folded, watching, or sat in groups in doorways. Women carrying clay water jugs on their heads, balanced with the aid of a single hand, moved tight against the walls to make room for the three horses. 
They made their way to and from the well in indifferent silence as Richard and Sister Verna passed. A few older men sat in wide doorways or leaned against walls. The men wore brimless, straight-sided, round, dark, flat-topped hats with strange markings in light colors that seemed to have been painted on with fingers. Many of the men smoked thin-stemmed pipes. Conversation fell silent as Richard and Sister Verna passed, and all watched the two strangers and three horses moving by. Some idly tugged on the long, dangling earrings they wore in their left ears. Sister Verna led the way through the narrow streets, taking them deeper into the maze of drab buildings. When they at last reached a wider cobblestone street, she halted, turned to him, and spoke in quiet warning. These people are the Magendi. Their land is a vast, crescent-shaped swath of forests. We must travel the length of their land, all the way to the point of the horn of their land. They worship spirits. Those skulls we saw back there were sacrifices to their spirits. Though they hold foolish beliefs, which are reprehensible, we do not have the power to change them. We need to pass through their land. You will do as they ask, or our skulls will end up with all the others on that pile. Richard refused to give her the satisfaction of an answer or an argument. He sat with his hands folded over the pommel of his saddle and without emotion watched her until she finally turned away and started out once more. After passing under a low bridge building, they entered a slightly dished open square. Perhaps a thousand men milled about or clustered in small groups. Like the other men he had seen, these all wore the one long dangling earring, though on the right side instead of the left. They also all wore short swords and black sashes. Unlike the other men, None of these wore hats on their shaved heads. Off in the center, a raised platform held a circle of men sitting cross-legged, facing inward around a thick pole. Here was the source of the eerie melody. A circle of women in black sat in a ring facing outward around the men. Standing with her back against the pole, a big woman in a billowing black outfit slid the back of her hand up the pole and took hold of a knot in the end of a rope hanging from a bell. As she watched Richard and the sister ride into the square, she rang the bell once. The sister brought them to an abrupt halt as the piercing peal drifted across the square, hushing the men and urging the flute players into faster strains. That is a warning, Sister Verna said, a warning to the spirits of their enemies. The bell is also a call to the warriors present. Those are these men here in the square. The spirits have been warned and the warriors called. If she rings that bell again, we die. Sister Verna glanced to his even expression. This is a sacrifice ritual to appease spirits. She watched men come and take hold of the reins of their horses. The circle of women in black stood and began to dance and twirl to the haunting music. When Sister Verna glanced at him again, Richard, with deliberate care, checked that his sword was loose in its scabbard. She sighed and then dismounted. When she cleared her throat in annoyance, he finally dismounted too. Sister Verna drew her light cloak tight around herself as she spoke to him while watching the women in black dance and spin around the pole and the woman in the center. The Magendi live in a crescent around a land of swampy forest in which live their enemy. The people who live in the heart of that forbidding land are a wild, savage lot and will not allow any of us through their land, much less guide us. Even if we could avoid them, we would become lost within an hour and never find our way out. The only way for us to reach the Palace of the Prophets, which lies beyond these savages, is to go around them, along the crescent of land belonging to the Magendi. Our destination lies between the cusps of the crescent belonging to the Magendi and beyond the savages in the center. She glanced over to make sure he was at least listening before she went on. The Magendi are at constant war with the savages who live in that swampy forest. In order to be permitted through Magendi land, we must prove we are allied with them and their spirits and not their enemy. Those skulls we saw are the skulls of this enemy who were sacrificed to the Magendi spirits. In order for us to be permitted to pass, we must help them in this sacrifice. The Magendi believe that men with the gift, like all men, carry the seed of life and soul endowed by the spirits. More, they believe that one with the gift has a special direct link with the spirits. A sacrifice made with the aid of a young man, with the gift, confers the sanctifying grace of their spirits upon all their people. They believe it breathes life, divine life, on their people. The Magendi require this participation when we bring young boys through for the first time, believing it links their spirits to those of the Magendi. 
This ceremony also ensures that the people with whom they are at war will hate wizards because they help the Majendi and will never cooperate with them. This, the Majendi believe, denies their enemy a divine channel to the spirit world. The men in the square all drew their short swords. Laying the swords on the ground with their points toward the woman in the center, they knelt with shiny heads bowed. The woman who rang the bell, the one in the center, is the leader of these people, the queen mother. She is the one who is bound to the female spirits. She represents the spirits of fertility in this world. She is the embodiment of the receptacle of the divine seed from the spirit world. The dancing women in black formed into a line and started off the platform in the direction of Richard and the sister. The queen mother is sending her representatives to take you to the sacrificial offering. Sister Verna glanced up at him, then fussed with the corner of her cloak. We are fortunate. This means they have one to be sacrificed. If we came here and they didn't, we would have to wait until one of their enemy was captured. Sometimes that can take weeks, even months. Richard said nothing. She turned her back to the approaching women in black and faced him. You will be taken to a place where the prisoner is held. There you will be offered the chance to give your blessing. Not giving your blessing means you wish to precede the prisoner in sacrifice. If you don't give your blessing, it will only ensure that you die too. You give your blessing by kissing the sacred knife they will offer you. You don't have to kill the person with your own hand. You have only to kiss the knife to give your blessing, to give the spirits blessings, and they will do the killing. But you must watch them do it, so the spirits will see the sacrifice through your eyes. She glanced over her shoulder at the approaching women in black. The beliefs of these people are obscene. She sighed in resignation and turned to face him again. Richard folded his arms and glared at her. I know you don't like this, Richard, but it has kept peace for 3,000 years between us and the Majendi. Though it sounds a paradox, it saves lives, more lives than it costs. The savages who are their enemy make war not only on them, but also on us. The palace and the civilized people of the old world are sporadically subjected to their raids and fierce attacks. Small wonder, Richard thought, but he said nothing. Sister Verna stepped aside to stand at his shoulder as the women in black formed into a dark knot before the two of them. All were older, perhaps the age of grandmothers. They were all portly, and their black outfits covered their hair and everything else except their wrinkled hands and faces. With gnarled fingers, one drew the coarse black fabric tight at her chin. She bowed her head to Sister Verna. Welcome, wise woman. Our centuries have told us of your approach for nearly a day now. We are pleased to have you among us, for it is the time of the planting sacrifice. Though we had not expected your presence, it would be a great homage to the spirits to have the blessing in the sacrifice. The old woman, who only came up to the height of his breastbone, looked Richard up and down. Then she spoke again to Sister Verna. This is a magic man? He is not a boy. We have never before brought one so old to the palace of the wise women, Sister Verna said. But he is a magic man, the same as the others. The old woman in black looked into Richard's eyes as he watched her without expression. He is too old to give the blessing, Sister Verna tensed. He is still a magic man. The woman nodded to the sister. But he is too old to have others perform the sacrifice for him. He must do it himself. He must give our sacrifice to the spirits by his own hand. She gestured for a woman behind to come forward. Lead him to where the offering waits. With a bob of her head, the woman came forward and indicated he was to follow. Sister Verna tugged on his shirt sleeve. Richard could feel the heat of magic radiating from her fingers up his arms, terminating in an uncomfortable tingling sensation at his neck under the Radahan. Richard, she whispered, don't you dare swing the axe this time. You know not what you will bring to ruin. Richard met her eyes before turning away without a word. The round old woman led him off down a muddy street past old men sitting in doorways, watching, and then turned them down a narrow alley. At the end, she stooped through a low doorway. Richard had to bend nearly in half to follow. Inside, carpets of intricate designs but dull colors covered the floor. There was no furniture except several low, leather-covered chests holding oil lamps. Four men with shaved heads squatted rather than sat on the rugs, two to each side of a passageway hung with a heavy tapestry instead of a door. Short spears with sharp, leaf-shaped iron heads rested across their knees. The unexpectedly high ceiling held a cloud of pipe smoke. The men stood and bowed to the old woman. She bobbed her head to them, and as she did so, drew Richard forward. This is the magic man. 
Since he is the age of a man, the Queen Mother directs that the spirits take the sacrifice through his hands. They all nodded and gave grim agreement that it was a wise decision and prayed she would tell the Queen Mother that it would be done as directed. The woman in black bid them fair fortune in the task. She closed the rough spruce door behind herself after stooping through the low opening. When she was gone, the men broke into grins. They all slapped Richard on the back, as if taking him into their confidence. The back of one man's shaved neck wrinkled in rows of furrows as he turned to glance at the tapestry-covered passageway. He put an arm around Richard's shoulder, giving it a squeeze with powerful fingers. You are fortunate indeed, lad. You are like what we have for you. His sly smile revealed a missing bottom tooth. Come with us. You'll like this, lad. We can promise you you will. He gave a hearty chuckle. Today you'll be a man, if you're not one yet. The other three laughed with him. The three pushed the tapestry aside, taking one of the lamps with them. The last man patted Richard's back, ushering him through. They all chuckled with anticipation. The next room was much the same as the first, minus the pipe smoke. They led on through a sequence of rooms, each bare of decoration except for a few carpets scattered about. The men finally squatted beside a last covered passageway, planted the butts of their spears, and with a hand on them for support leaned toward him. They all shared the same cunning smiles. Careful now, lad. Don't be too anxious. Keep your head about yourself and you'll have yourself a time with this savage. They chuckled again with the private joke as they pushed the hanging aside and went through. Inside, the small square room had a bare dirt floor. The ceiling was at least three stories high. A window near the top of one wall cast the small room in dim light. The place smelled of the chamber pot off to the side. Crouched to the far left was a naked woman. She tried to push herself farther into the corner when she saw the men. Arms around her knees, she pulled them tight to herself. She was covered with dirty marks and smears, cuts, and bruises. Her mass of long, tangled black hair frizzed out, framing her filthy face. Her dark eyes narrowed with loathing as she watched the four men. By their leering smiles, she had cause to know them. Around her neck was a thick iron collar connected by heavy chain to a massive pin in the wall. The men spread out around the room, squatted, and leaned their backs against the walls. Their fists held their spears upright between their knees. Richard imitated them, squatting and leaning against the wall to the woman's right. I wish to speak with the spirits, Richard said. The four men blinked at him. I must ask them how they wish it done. There is only one way to do it, the man with the missing tooth said. You must cut off her head. Now that the iron collar is around her neck, it's the only way to get her out. Her head must be separated from her body. Even so, it must be done in the manner the spirits wish. I must talk with them. I must know exactly how to do this, to please them. They all considered this. The man with the missing tooth pushed his cheek out with his tongue as he pondered. Finally, he brightened. The Queen Mother and her women drink jukka to speak with the spirits. I could bring you some jukka, and then you too could speak with the spirits. Then bring me this jukka, so I may speak with the spirits and do as they command. I would not want to make a mistake and ruin your planting sacrifice. The men agreed that this was a wise request, considering that Richard was to make the sacrifice himself instead of simply blessing it. One of the men hurried off. The other three waited in silence, again leering at the woman. She moved her feet closer together to cover herself as she squatted in the corner and glowered back. One man pulled a thin-stemmed pipe and a long splinter from a pocket. He lit the splinter in the flame of the lamp and used it to light his pipe. He puffed as he watched the woman, eyeing her in an intimate way. Her chin held defiantly up, the woman glared back. The smoke drifted up into the dim air as his steady puffing quickened. Richard crouched, leaning against the wall with his arms folded across his lap so as to partially hide his right hand draped nonchalantly near the hilt of his sword. The fourth man finally came back, carrying a round clay pot in both hands. The pot had a small opening in the top and white symbols painted around the sides. The Queen Mother and her women agreed and sent this jukka, so you may call the spirits. When you drink this, the spirits will visit you. He set the pot in front of Richard, and then pulling a knife from his belt, held the green malachite handle out to him. It was carved with figures in obscene poses. This is the sacred knife to be used in the sacrifice. 
When Richard took the knife and slid the stout blade behind his belt, the man joined his fellows squatting against the walls. The man closest to the woman on the other side seemed pleased that the queen mother had sent the juka. He gave Richard a knowing wink. Then he lifted his spear point to the woman's face. The magic man has come to offer you to the spirits. He smiled encouragement past her to Richard. But first, he would like to give you the spirit's gift of his seed. She didn't move. His smile transformed into a sneer as he thumped the butt of his spear to the dirt. Do not insult the spirits. You will take their offering. His voice lowered to a growl. No. Her eyes never leaving him, she uncoiled herself and obediently lay down on the dirt on her back. She opened her legs and cast Richard a defiant glance. She obviously knew the consequence of denying these men what they wished. The man sprang forward and stabbed his spear into her thigh muscle. She screamed out and flinched back. You know better than that. You will not insult us. We are not stupid. He feigned another jab. Do it properly. Richard's fingers curled around the hilt of his sword, but otherwise he did not move. The woman made no effort to tend the bleeding gash on her leg, but instead obediently turned over onto her elbows and knees, sticking her bottom up in the air. The men chuckled to Richard. You would not like to lie with this one face to face, the man with the missing tooth said. She bites. The others nodded their certain knowledge of that. Mount her this way and hold her by her hair. She will not be able to bite you this way, and you can have all you wish. The men waited. Neither Richard nor the woman moved. Can you fools not see, the woman said. He does not wish to mount me like a dog in front of you. Her face lying against the dirt, she gave Richard a mocking smile. He is shy. He does not wish you to see how little his magic stick is. Every eye was on him. Richard's knuckles were white around the hilt. He strained to put an emotionless face over the rage of the magic searing through him from the sword. He struggled to maintain reason. Letting the magic loose in here would accomplish nothing. One of the men gave a playful elbow to another and laughed. Perhaps she is right. He is a young one. Maybe he is not used to others watching his pleasure. The seams around his control were strained near to bursting. Richard concentrated on keeping his free hand steady and making it move gracefully. He lifted the clay pot with the juca, showing it to them. He labored mightily to keep his voice even. The spirits wished to speak to me of important matters. The smiles all withered. They knew him as a magic man, but not a young one as they were used to seeing. They didn't have any idea of his power, but were obviously worried about it worried about his smoldering, too quiet smoothness. We must leave him to his duty, one of the men said. We should leave him to be with the spirits and to take his pleasure from the savage if he wishes before he gives the spirits this offering. He bowed his shiny head to Richard. We will leave you to your peace. We will wait in the room where you saw us first. Solemn-faced, the four hurried off. After they were gone and she could be sure they were a good distance away, the woman spat at him. She arched her back like a cat in heat, sticking her behind higher in the air. You may mount me now like the dog you are. Come, magic man, prove you can mount a woman when she is held for you by a chain. You can do no worse to me than the other dogs. She spat at him again. You are all dogs. Richard extended his leg and shoved a foot against her hip, tipping her over. I'm not like those men. She rolled onto her back. She threw her arms and legs open and gave him a contemptuous glare. So oh, you wish to have me like this to prove you are better than they? Richard gritted his teeth. Stop it. I'm not here for that. She sat up. She lifted her chin, but her eyes filled with sudden terror. So you will sacrifice me now? Richard realized his hand was still gripping the hilt. He had forgotten to maintain a calm expression. He took his hand away, letting the magic recede and his rage cool. As she watched, he poured the juca on the dirt floor. I'm going to get you out of this. My name is Richard. What's yours? Her eyes narrowed. Why do you wish to know? Well, if I'm going to take you out of here, I need to know what to call you. I can't call you woman. She surveyed him silently for a moment. I am Du Shailu. Do I call you Du or Shailu or Du Shailu? Puzzlement wrinkled her brow. Du Shailu. That is my name. Richard gave her a smile of reassurance. All right, then. Du Shailu. Who are your people? What are they called? We are Baka Ban Mana. 
And what does that mean, Baka Ban Mana? Her chin came up again. Those without masters. Richard smiled to himself. I think you are worthy of your people. You don't look to be a woman to be mastered. Chin still held up. She studied his eyes. You say these words, but you intend to mount me as the others. Richard shook his head. No, I told you I wouldn't do that. I'm going to try to get you out of here and back to your people. None of my people captured by the Magendi ever returns. Richard leaned toward her. Then you shall be the first. Richard drew his sword. Du Shailu scooted back against the wall, drawing her knees up to her chest, hiding her face. He realized that she had misinterpreted his action and expected the worst. It's all right, Du Shailu. I'm not going to hurt you. I simply need to get that collar off you. She shrank from him. Then, thinking better of her shameful retreat, she lifted her head and spat at him. Yes, by taking off my head, you do not speak the truth. You wish to kill me now and just want me to meekly offer you my neck. With his sleeve, Richard wiped the spittle off the side of his forehead. He reached out and put a comforting hand to her shoulder. No, I'm not going to hurt you. I simply need to use this sword to get the collar off. How else can I get you out of here? You will be safe, you'll see. Let me get it off you. Swords cannot cut iron. Richard lifted an eyebrow. Magic can. She squeezed her eyes shut and held her breath as he gently put an arm around her shoulder and rolled her face down in his lap. He laid the sword's point to the side of her neck. He had seen the sword of truth cut through iron before, and he knew the sword's magic could do the job. She lay dead still as he slid the sword under the heavy iron band. And then she lunged at him. In a blink, she had a fierce grip on his left arm. Her teeth clamped around his forearm, pinching the nerves. Richard froze. He knew that if he were to try to yank his arm back, her teeth would probably tear the muscle from the bone. He still had his right hand on the sword. The rage of the magic pounded through him. He used the anger to help him block the pain and remain still. With the sword under the collar as it was, it would be a simple matter to give it a twist and a push. It would cut her throat if not decapitate her, and he would be free of her teeth. The pain from her locking bite was agonizing. Du Shai Lu, he managed through gritted teeth. Let go. I'm not going to hurt you. If it were my intention to hurt you, I could cut you right now with a sword to make you let go. After a long moment, silent of everything but his labored breathing, she relaxed the pressure of her teeth, but didn't release his arm from her grip. She tilted her head a bit. Why? Her eyes peered up at him. Why do you wish to help me? Richard stared down into her dark eyes. He took a chance and removed his hand from the sword. He brought the hand up and touched his fingers to the cold metal collar around his neck. I, too, am a prisoner. I, too, know what it is to be held by a collar. I don't like collars. Though I can't free myself in this way, I can try to free you. Her ferocious grip on his arm relaxed. She cocked her head to the side as she frowned up at him. But you are a magic man. That's why I was taken prisoner. The woman I'm with is taking me to a place called the Palace of the Prophets. She says the magic will kill me if I don't go to this place. You are with one of the witches from the Big Stone Witch House? She is not a witch, but one with magic too. She put this collar on me to make me go with her. Du Shailu's eyes flicked over the collar around his neck. If you let me go, the Magendi will not allow you to go through their land to the Big Stone House. Richard gave her a little smile. I was hoping that if I helped you get back to your people, you would permit us to pass through your land, and maybe that you would guide us so that we might reach the palace. A sly smile spread on her lips. We could kill the witch. Richard shook his head. I don't kill people unless I'm forced to. It would not help anyway. I must go to the palace to get my collar off. If I don't go there, I will die. Du Shailu looked away from his gaze. Richard waited while she glanced around her prison. I do not know if you speak the truth or if you mean to cut my throat. She gently rubbed his arm where she had bitten him. But if you kill me, I was to be killed anyway and had no chance. And at least I will not be mounted anymore by those dogs. If you tell the truth, then I will be free. But we must still escape. We are still in the land of the Magendi. Richard winked. I have a plan. At least we can try. She frowned at him. You could do this thing to me and they would be happy and you could go to the palace. You would be safe. Are you not afraid they will kill you? Richard nodded. 
but I am more afraid to live the rest of my life seeing in my mind your pretty eyes and wishing I had helped you. She gave him a sidelong glance. Maybe you are a magic man, but you are not a smart man. A smart man would want to be safe. I am the seeker. What is this, the seeker? It's a long story, but I guess it means I do my best to see the truth prevail, to see right done. This sword has magic, and it helps me in my quest. It's called the Sword of Truth. She let out a long breath and finally laid her head back in his lap. Try then, or kill me. I was dead anyway. Richard gave her filthy bare back a pat of reassurance. Hold still. He reached under her neck and wrapped his fingers around the collar, holding it tight. With his other hand, the hand on the hilt, the hand through which the magic was coursing into him, he gave a mighty heave. With a loud crack, the iron shattered. Hot shards of metal ricocheted off the walls. One large piece spun like a top in the dirt, finally wobbling and falling over. Silence settled over them. He held his breath, hoping none of the metal fragments had cut her throat. Du Chailu sat up, her eyes wide. She felt her neck. Finding no injury, she broke into a wide grin. It is off. You got the collar off and my head is still attached. Richard feigned a touch of indignation. I told you I would. Now we must get away from here. Come on. He led her back through the rooms the way he had come. When he reached the next to last room from where the men waited, he held a finger to his lips and told her to be quiet and wait for him to come back for her. She folded her arms under her bare breasts. Why? I will go with you. You said you would not leave me here. Richard let out an exasperated breath. I'm going to get you some clothes. We can't leave with you... With a gesture, he indicated her bare condition. She unfolded her arms and looked down at herself. Why? What is wrong with me? I am not a bad shape to look upon. Many men have told me... What is it with you people? He whispered heatedly. I have seen more naked people since I left my homeland last autumn than in the whole of my life. And not a one of you seems the least bit... She grinned. Your face is red. Richard growled through gritted teeth. Wait here. Smirking, she folded her arms again. I will wait. In the outer room, the four men jumped to their feet when Richard came through the carpet-covered opening. He didn't give them any time to ask questions. Where are the woman's clothes? Confused, they glanced at one another. Her clothes? Why do you want... Richard took an aggressive stride toward the man. Who are you to question the spirits? Do as they say. Get me her clothes. All four flinched back. They stared at him briefly and then went to the low chest. They set the lamps aside and opened the lids, rummaging through the chests, tossing clothes aside. Here I found them, one of them said. He held up a garment that looked to be finely woven flax. Different colored strips hung in rows from the light brown fabric. This is hers, he held up a buckskin belt. And this too. Richard snatched them from the man's fist. You will wait here. He grabbed up a scrap of cloth the men had thrown on the floor as they had searched for the dress. He went back through the opening before there was time for any questions. Du Shailu waited, her arms still folded. When she saw what he held in his hands, she gasped. She clutched the dress to her breast. Tears filled her dark eyes. My prayer dress! She threw her arms around his neck and, raising up on her tiptoes, started kissing him all over his face. Richard mashed her mass of black hair flat against the sides of her head as he pushed her away. All right, all right, put it on. Hurry. Grinning at him, she pulled the dress over her head, poking her arms through the long sleeves. Up the outside of each arm and across the shoulders was a row of little strips of different colored cloth. Each was knotted on through a small hole beneath a corded band. The dress came to just below her knees. As she tied the belt at her waist, Richard noticed the blood still running down to her foot from where the men had stabbed her in the thigh. He dropped to one knee before her and motioned with his hands. Lift it up. Lift up your dress. Du Shai Lu looked down at him. She lifted an eyebrow. I have just covered myself, and now you wish me to uncover? Richard pursed his lips. He waved the strip of cloth at her. You are bleeding. I need to put this around the wound. Giggling, she raised her skirt and held her leg out, rotating it from side to side, displaying it in a teasing manner. Richard quickly wrapped the cloth around her thigh over the gash and jerked the knot tight. She yelped with pain. He thought it served her right, but apologized anyway. Taking her by the hand, he pulled her through the remaining rooms. As he passed through the last, he growled at the four men to stay where they were. Still holding Du Shailu's hand tight, 
He led her back down the alleyway and streets to the open square. He saw the heads of the three horses sticking up above the sea of shiny bald heads. He plowed his way through the throng toward the horses. Chapter 43 Although his sword sat in its scabbard, he was already drawing its magic. Rage surged into him. He summoned it ever onward, letting his barriers fall before its advance. He was entering a silent world all his own, a world of grim committal to what he was, bringer of death. Sister Verna paled when she saw him pulling Du Shailu after, becoming even paler when she saw his demeanor. Without a word to her, Richard snatched his bow off the side of his saddle. He grunted with the effort of swiftly stretching the bowstring to the bow. He yanked two steel-bladed arrows from the quiver, hanging from Bonnie's saddle. His chest heaved with wrath. The crowd had all turned toward him. Puzzled faces bobbed up as men behind jumped to get a view. The women in black all looked up in his direction. The Queen Mother watched. Sister Verna's face was by now bright red. Richard, what do you think? Richard shoved her back. Be quiet. Bow and arrows in hand, he leapt up onto his saddle. The mumbling fell silent. Richard directed himself to the Queen Mother. I have spoken with the spirits. The back of the Queen Mother's hand started sliding up the pole toward the bell's rope. That was all the sign he needed. She had been offered a chance. The irrevocable commitment had been made. He loosed the magic within himself. In one swift motion, Richard knocked an arrow. He drew string to cheek. He called the target. The arrow was away. The air hissed with the sound of the arrow's flight. The crowd gasped. Before the arrow reached the target, while the air still sizzled with its sound, Richard had the second arrow knocked and on target. With a twanging thunk, the first arrow made a solid hit dead on where he intended it. The Queen Mother let out a clipped cry of surprise and pain. Penetrating the space between the two bones in her wrist, the arrow pinned her arm to the pole, preventing her hand from reaching the bell's rope. Her other hand started over toward the rope. The second arrow sat rock solid in the invisible notch in the air, on target, waiting. Move toward the bell and the second arrow goes through your right eye. The gaggle of women in black fell to their knees, wailing. The Queen Mother became still. Blood trickled down her arm. Inside, storms of anger thundered through him. Outside, he was stone. You will hear what the spirits have commanded. Slowly, the Queen Mother let her free hand drop to her side. Speak their words, then. Richard still held the bowstring to his cheek and had no intention of letting it relax. Though the arrow was aimed at one, his ire was directed at all. Magic burned through him at full fury. The force of rage pounded through his veins. In the past, it had always been focused on an enemy, someone specific. This was different. It was an open-ended rage. Rage at all those present, at everyone involved in human sacrifice. This was non-specific wrath. That made it worse. It drew more magic. Richard didn't know if it was the all-encompassing threat that drew more magic, or if it was because of all the practicing he had done with Sister Verna, enabling him to focus. But whatever the reason, he was calling forth more magic from the sword than he ever had before, more than he had known was there. The magic seethed with frightening power. The very air vibrated with it. The men about stepped back. The wailing women fell into a hush. The Queen Mother's face was white against the black of her dress. A thousand people stood in silent terror of one. The spirits wish no more sacrifices. It does not prove your devotion to them, only that you can kill. From now on, you must show your respect of the spirits by showing respect for the lives of the Bakaban Mana. If you do not, the spirits will vent their wrath by destroying you. Take their threat to heart, or they will bring starvation and death to the Majendi. He spoke to the men as they pressed forward. If any of you makes a move against me or these two women, the Queen Mother dies. They all glanced to one another, seeking courage. You may think to kill me, he told them the target not wavering in the slightest. But you cannot before the Queen Mother dies. You saw the shot I made. My hand is guided by magic. I do not miss. The men backed away. Let him be, the Queen Mother called out. Hear what he has to say. I have told you what the spirits have said. You will obey. She was silent a moment. We will consult the spirits ourselves. You would insult them? 
you would be admitting you do not heed their words, but your own worldly wishes. But we must... I'm not here to bargain on their behalf. The spirit of order I give the sacrificial knife to this woman so she may carry it back to her people to show them that the Majendi will no longer hunt them. The spirits will warn you of their anger by taking the seed you plant, and only when you send representatives to the Baka Ban Mana and tell them you agree to the wishes of the spirits will you be able to plant your crops. If you do not follow the spirits' wishes, you will all starve to death. We are leaving now. I will have your word that we will be granted safe leave of your land or you will die right now. We must consider... I grant you until the count of three to give me your decision. One, two, three, the Queen Mother gasped. The women in black gasped. The crowd gasped. What have you decided? The Queen Mother held her free hand up, imploring he hold his arrow. You may go. You have the word of the Queen Mother that you may leave our land unharmed. A wise decision. Her hand closed into a fist, one finger pointing toward them. But this is a violation of our agreement with the wise woman. The accord is at an end. You must leave our land at once. You are banished. So be it, Richard said. But keep to your word, or you will reap the grim rewards of any imprudent action. He released the tension from the bow. Standing in the stirrups, he pulled the sacred knife from his belt and held it up high for all to see. This woman will take this back to her people and tell them of the words of the spirits. As to their part, the Baka Ban Mana may no longer make war on the Majendi. You may no longer make war on them. You will be two peoples at peace. Neither may harm the other. Heed the words of the spirits or bear the consequences. His voice dropped to a fierce whisper, yet the wrath of the magic carried the words to the farthest corners of the square, and in the stillness every ear could hear them. Heed my orders, or suffer what I will bring upon you. I will lay waste to you. Magic lay over the square like fog in a valley, ethereal yet real, a palpable manifestation of his outrage that touched everyone present and all trembled at that touch. Richard leapt off his horse. The men shrank back a few more steps. Sister Verna was speechless with rage. He had never seen her in such a state. She stood as if paralyzed with her fists out before her. Richard leveled his glare and his wrath on her. Get on your horse, sister. We're leaving. Her jaw looked ready to shatter under the pressure of how tightly it was clenched. You are mad. We will not... Richard thrust a finger toward her. If you wish to argue with someone, sister, you may stay and argue with these people. I'm sure they will oblige you. I'm going to the palace to get this collar off. If you want to go with me, then get on your horse. There is no way. We cannot now travel the horn of the Majendi land. We are banished. Richard lifted his thumb to Du Shailu. She will guide us to the palace of the prophets through the Bakabanmana's land. Du Shailu folded her arms and gave the sister a self-satisfied smile. Sister Verna looked from her to Richard. You truly are mad. We cannot... Richard gritted his teeth with a growl, the sword's anger still at full fury. If you wish to go with me to the palace, get on your horse. I'm leaving. Du Shailu watched as Richard stuck the green-handled knife behind her buckskin belt. I have charged you with the responsibility. You will live up to it. Now, get up on that horse. Du Shailu unfolded her arms in sudden worry, looking to the horse and back to him. She folded her arms again and put her nose in the air. I will not ride on that beast. It stinks. So do you, Richard roared. Now get up on that horse. She flinched back. Eyes wide in fright at his glare, she swallowed, gulping air. Now I know what a seeker is. She scrambled awkwardly up onto Geraldine. The sister was already atop Jessup. Richard vaulted up onto Bonnie. With a last warning look at the men gathered, he squeezed his horse's ribs, and she sprang into a gallop. The other two horses took out after him. The men swept back out of the way. The magic hungered for blood, raged for it. Richard wished someone would try to stop him. No one did. Please, Du Shailu said. It is almost dark. May we please stop or at least allow me to walk? This beast is hurting me. She was holding on for dear life, bouncing in the saddle as Geraldine trotted along. The little strips of colored cloth on her dress were all a flutter. He could hear Sister Verna's horse trotting along behind, but he didn't look back at her. 
Richard glanced up at the sun setting beyond the thick tangle of branches. His rage was finally withering with the light. For a time, it had seemed as if he would never be able to put it down. Du Shailu pointed past him with her chin to his right, afraid to lift a hand. There is a small pond there, through the reeds and a grassy place before it. Are you sure we are in Bakaban Mana land? She nodded. For the last few hours, this is our land. I know this place. All right, we will stop for the night. 